Let's start with TV. Let's watch, comment a little, if anything. It was during the shooting process, when we opened the pyramid for the first time. Is it visible? The direction of movement is running with the change, that is, the trajectory is markedly changing. This is in our yard. Those are posers. They often come. We took just a little to show here, the rest will be in the film. More details will be provided there. Synchronous, beautiful. As you can see, they are practically hovering. It cannot be any kind of insects or anything else, as they are trying to say. But this topic is really closed and nobody officially studies it. Look, it has flown out of the ground, have you seen it? The skyfish are literally flying out of the ground. We've got this all recorded on our street cameras. As you can see, it's winter in the street, it's cold. Well, there's no way it can be some frost-resistant insect. Well, thank God that they are posing for us slowly, letting us examine them. That is, their whole manner suggests that they are not insects, but this is exactly their structure. Look how clearly it can be examined. The whole structure is clearly visible, as it actually looks. Well, those are again our posers. This is an experiment we performed here, downstairs. 
the guys are trying to perform a spiritual practice. This is before the beginning of the experiment, and the experiment is a little later on. Well, it's natural that it starts, you see? What a beautiful things appear! There will be a lot of interesting things here too. Interestingly, they are flat. That's like a coin, let's say. This will be clearly seen when they are turning around while changing position. They will be changing from these rods, let's say, to such round little things. A bit of striptease, Have you seen? They're so interesting. That's with a change of the trajectory, so that no one says that it's just something falling. And now in slow motion, this is a horizontal flight. Such various things, but he didn't see it. Imagine if he had seen that. It would have put an end to the experiment. This is not the scariest thing. The most scary and interesting thing is a little bit further. Later on we will tell you why we conducted this experiment. Jumping ahead, let's say, it didn't quite work out, but then there were all sorts of things shot that were not quite clear. The camera has infrared illumination, so his eyes are glowing a little. These are the plasmoids running away out of fear. They saw his eyes, filled with goodness. The most interesting thing, guys, is that all this is real shooting. It is not some Photoshop or anything. We have the originals of the recordings. This is what is really being shot. This is something that we do not see in everyday life, but it is around us. And the paradox is that it was noticed at certain time even with the naked eye. Now, the technical environment allows us to observe all this, record, show, share, as they say, but people used to observe it before too. But all these phenomena were forbidden to be studied, that's the point. Go on, show it. This is such an interesting glow that is moving along the pavement. It will be shown again now. We zoomed in, looked, nothing was gleaming, no lights anywhere. This is such a manifestation. Here it can be seen further, it manifested again there too.
Someone may say that there is light from the road coming or something else, it will show. We also thought like that in the beginning. But then, as we see, it can't be a reflection of the light on the road, and nowhere it can be illuminated by anything, for such a manifestation it simply can't. It is just there. One of the varieties of plasmoids, As you can see here, in the shadows, in the light, let's say, nothing is changing all along the street. But this phenomenon is present. Someone was even walking over there. They were lucky too, didn't see it. That's interesting, there is a parked car, now here it is departed under the car, then it is coming out from under the car and... Once again, we are showing it without highlighting circles, so that you could see for yourself, and see that there is no interference here. Let's say, no Photoshop, nothing else. And now the most interesting part. You have to look carefully here, in the left upper corner and above the feet of our operator. Up above there is a spot on the wall. Keep an eye on it. This is what we simply lose sight of on a daily basis. Well, here, let's say, in the middle to the right, and there, closer to the pyramid, closer to the steps, everything is distinctly and clearly visible too. It's a delicate matter, it's all a little bit… a literal change of shadows, a faint play of light, although in other places the light is not changing, that is, the lighting is not changing at all. But the movement of shadows is evident. In the previous program, by the way, we raised the question about those who live in shadows, when we mentioned Sheikh, Mir Said, Baraka, we talked about it. Here, the last part is precisely the most interesting. The essence of the experiment which we conducted was precisely about what a person experiences, well, whatever they are called, incubi or something else, basically sort of demonic or some fleshless beings sometimes come to people, most often this occurs during sleep and causes a lot of inconvenience to people. Our operator, he experiences it from time to time, goes through it, so we asked him to demonstrate, that is, to record, so that he would artificially contact his settlers, so to speak. He likes it, so it's not a big trouble for him. Well, we asked him to go through it again, and all of this would be filmed with camera. As a rule in such cases, the movement of shadows is very clearly visible through digital cameras under certain conditions. We try to create such conditions, but we got what we got. Anyway, this incubi did not come to him, but we saw other phenomena, that is, in the literal sense of the word, well, I think we will repeat the experiment. It's interesting, and perhaps we'll show something in the future. Many people have a question, why do we show all this? Why do we talk about this? For understanding of the essence. 
Why have we raised these topics and have recently been developing them a little? Gradually, we have been telling a little bit about the spiritual path, a little bit about how a person can cope with his consciousness, what a personality is, how to hold on to this perception through feelings, how to gain it at all, this perception through feelings. Subsequently, we gave a little more information. Now, we begin to talk about what a person does not see with the naked eye and what, in fact, can influence a person in addition to everything else that is apart from his consciousness, apart from other people. What happens? Why is it necessary when a person really develops spiritually, he begins to know these such things, and so that it wouldn't be some kind of a shock for him when he encounters it and would not think that it's time to see Tatiana. For those who don't know, she's a psychotherapist. For that reason, we show this and say that it's normal. From time immemorial, it has been observed, it has been talked about, but this topic is absolutely forbidden just as, let's say, the study of such things. In science, it was subject to punishment. Now, thank God, it doesn't come to that. There is too much information of that kind, because digital technologies constantly highlight all this. And this can be talked about now. I once said that we show and conduct those experiments, taking into account, say, well, our scarce human, technical and material resources. Well, we do what we can in order to at least acquaint you a little and show you what happens at the invisible level. First of all, in order to help those who begin their spiritual path, who encounter similar phenomena, as I've already said. And secondly, in order to dispel doubts among people that we are not alone here. And I repeat the words of Baraka, that this invisible world, it is like a sea. There's much life there, and really so much life. In the last experiment, we show something very interesting about erythrocytes. Here, look, the picture of erythrocytes, well, certainly they have changed. They have a full charge, it's understandable. Here, see how they should actually look. I think very few people have seen anything like this. Here, look at the picture, my friends. We will compare and show you later on, yes? Here is how the picture should look for an almost healthy person. Once we performed another very interesting experiment, perhaps we'll show it right now. Let's talk about experiments, who encounters what. We won't show the experiment itself, but a hint about this experiment. Why? Because we recorded the experiment itself, but we cannot show it. We will show the essence of what this experiment was about. These are cuts from the movies, put simply, what the public thinks of this experiment. And it is interesting, what will you think? How will your consciousness react? That is, does it make sense to repeat it or not? Because we have a request from some participants to repeat the experiment but with cameras and under more correct conditions. This is what concerns blood, let's call it aggressive blood, from the movies. Well, this topic has long been around, not only among the creators of the film industry and among the writers of science fiction, but also among people who have deeply and seriously studied various metaphysical manifestations.
This is a key point. Well, you must agree, this looks unreal, doesn't it? But when blood is approaching, like blood, the blood of a living creature, of a humanoid, is approaching an ordinary piece of meat, when it approaches and attacks like a wild animal, this doesn't look very nice. This is an absolute reality, and viruses have nothing to do with this. We will see, some people have a desire to repeat the expedition. If we are able to organize it, then… Well, if again, this information doesn't agitate the public, then we will repeat it. Last time we simply had to destroy all materials, every last one. Therefore, God willing, we will possibly return to this topic. Now, as to what it all is for and why, I have already said that people should know after all, and should study that invisible world which is around us, then it would be easier to figure out where the thoughts come from, why do such nice people sometimes have such aggressive thoughts. Again, questions of a suicidal nature. After all, almost every person experiences these thoughts in life and lives through this, and these thoughts come to people. But not everyone talks about this, or not everyone focuses on this, let's say. And why is this happening? Who needs this? And so, if you have noticed, recently suicide rates have increased by several times around the world. And the saddest thing is that these are seemingly prosperous countries, but the rate is growing. Yes, there is overpopulation, informational overload, much can be said that there are special people who sort of amuse themselves, driving young people to suicide or something else, purely from a psychological point of view or some kind of an economic one. But there are other, let's say, beings who are pushing them to it, because they cannot be called people, who actually drive people to suicide. And if a person isn't forearmed with at least certain understandings, when he encounters this, then the picture in his head is replaced. Well, if we talk to many suicide attempt victims who were miraculously saved, not to those who psychologically try to draw attention to themselves in such a manner, so as to accentuate their own personality, these people are slightly unhealthy, let's say so, both spiritually and morally. Well, that's why they use suicide as a tool, just to amuse their megalomania. But with those who, in fact, well, most often there are present-day situations, when a person lives a wonderful life, there are no signs of anything, nothing bad, and then he simply commits suicide. And those who are saved, they ask, why did you do it? He can't explain. We have a psychotherapist here, and we say it again. She can confirm it because she has obviously encountered this in her work, and more than once. The picture of reality changes for a person. He has a burning desire to do something, but at times he is unaware of anything at all. And they are well aware that they are doing something good, but behind this good there are standing exactly those or more precisely the ones whom we called Kanduks, for those who have read the book as Osmos. None of this is a fairy tale, it's all life, it's all reality. Again, why does one need to know this? Well, at least if a burning thought comes and all your attention narrows down to a point and it seems that life is meaningless, then such thoughts wouldn't come from the good, such thoughts come only, let's say, from those who hide in the shadows or from those who control these shadows. There can be no morality, no feelings, or anything else here. It is just that those whom we don't see want to eat. It is only due to their hunger. And as for those very incubi, the ones who come, as we said, well, we carried out an experiment and showed it, but it didn't quite work out. Still, we are now going to ask, we have a person here who has experienced it all more than once, to tell about it at least briefly if people are interested, because there are also those who have experienced it too. Actually, a lot of people experience this, but don't always pay attention or realize what it is and why it is happening. Well, please tell us briefly. Well, to be brief, some creatures started visiting me. It all began to happen after certain events. Well, without going into details, it turned out so that I was exercising practices but I did not change my lifestyle altogether. That's the key. It's absolutely true. So I'll comment here straight away, so there is an understanding. The person tries to engage in certain 
practices, but at the same time she remained herself. What was happening? Imbalance. A person is becoming stronger in terms of energy. Or to put it simply, this bun is being sprinkled with sugar. Well, it is for those who want to eat, I mean. She becomes more delicious, but at the same time she remains controllable. Controllable by consciousness and those who are in the shadows. And consequently it leads to… well, continue, I'm sorry. That's right. And one day, after performing a practice that involved sexual energy… I'll interrupt again. There are no children here, I suppose. We can talk a little more about this topic too. Sexual energy being the forerunner of, let's say, certain powers, in this case the powers of Alat, is naturally a tasty morsel for those who are in the shadows. Therefore, you must understand that this power is hunted for, and most often it happens during such energy outbursts. That is where it begins. Please go on. Right. And after the practice, I was lying and feeling as if someone physically struck me with a fist very hard in the area of the middle gate. There was such a feeling. You mean in the back, between your shoulder blades? Yes, right. Well, not everybody knows what the middle and upper gates are. I have a gate in my garage, for example. Well, it's different for everyone. Yes, in the area of shoulder blades. And then that night, I just don't remember if I woke up because of that. I think yes. I woke up because I felt that someone was sitting on me right on my chest. And I actually felt it. And there is a little point here. Many talk about this, especially psychologists, that in reality no one is sitting there and the person is experiencing suffocation, that it's kind of a muscle spasm, and it is just imagined. But this can be said by the one who hasn't experienced it. The one who has really experienced it has no doubt that something material was sitting on him, right? Yes, indeed. There were no doubts. I had an impression that something was just wrong with my eyes, that I did not see it, but it really was there. I could feel the exact distance. It was from my face at that moment. So it all did happen. I felt it very, very vividly. And simultaneously fear started growing intensely. And it was accompanied by the fact that I had a feeling as if my body was sort of being swept away by wind. So I gradually ceased to feel it, the body. As a result, the fear started growing even stronger, because I had already heard a lot about such creatures. And I was scared because I thought that this creature could take my place, meaning it could somehow kick me out of my body and take my place. So, and this happened to me more than once and… Well, people are probably interested. To know what you felt, what you experienced, what was that creature doing? Exactly at those moments. Here is another little point, please take notice. Immediately, in most cases, everyone starts feeling compression, as if someone is sitting or pressing down on their chest. That is, we perfectly understand, those who have engaged in spiritual practices, they know, that it precisely blocks what is called a silver thread, it gets compressed. And there is a disconnection of the Personality from what people call the Soul, which is located lower in the Solar Plexus area of the energy structure. And this connection gets immediately disrupted. When it is disrupted, there is a feeling of pressure. Those who have experienced some resentment or inner anger felt the same thing, compression in the chest. It's by no means a function of the heart, it's not nerve clusters, no. This is a real physical feeling of that which, and sometimes it causes panic attacks, well, it may be attributed again to a disease or something else, but any medical condition clearly differs precisely from that factor when something interferes and blocks this connection. Why? Because the first thing that is experienced is the panic of the Personality. It is not clear what is happening, and at the same time there is a feeling of despair, insecurity, for as long as a person has connection, as a Personality, with what we call the Soul, or, well, some call it a portal or something else, that is, connection with the spiritual world, at least some kind of connection. The person is more or less calm, and he reacts to such things more calmly. But when this connection is blocked, we immediately yield to the power of those who are hiding in the shadows. And I indeed, yes, I've just recalled that it was so scary because I realized that no one could help me, no one at all. And, and how can I cope with something that I do not see? And who can help me? So I had such a reaction, I flew off the bed and I didn't know what to do. Because, well, how could I help myself? 
I started to catch myself somehow, well, at least my body, in order to start feeling somehow, to come to my senses. I was scared to sleep afterwards. And such manifestations began to occur. But still, another interesting thing was that I had a relationship with a man at that time. And this creature began to appear during the sexual intercourse. There was a distinct feeling that someone was standing there, watching all of this. I mean, well, even if perhaps a living person was standing there, it wouldn't be felt as much. That being said, all this was really escalated. And at those moments, when this creature came, it felt as if a black hole was opening inside of me, and energy was draining away into it. So I don't know, I had such a feeling that it was draining away, and out of him too. And what exactly? Here again, everyone keeps saying, energy, energy. But describe what were you feeling? What was draining away? How was it draining away? After all, you see, for many, energy is electricity, or something else. But you say you had a feeling of a black hole, right? It happened, and it was as if something was draining away into it. But describe what you were feeling. I was feeling like, I don't know, just like a vacuum cleaner hose, through which something was flowing. Someone came up with such an association. And what was flowing through it? Well, as I later on felt by my state… What is your understanding of this? Life was leaving me. Well, because then, after such cases, when this creature would come to me, I felt, well, the more often it came, the less alive I felt. And the worse it made me feel both morally and physically. I mean, my physical state was gradually getting worse. I began to develop, well, an impression that all the viruses that had been in the body got activated and everything started getting even worse. Well, to express it in medical terms, your immune system got weaker, didn't it? Then depression started to develop. Depression. What is also interesting here, it turns out that I had a relationship with this man, and so this began to happen. I just had an impression that my consciousness was as if artificially narrowed down to this one man. I had never experienced such a state in my life. And How can you describe this? Love, passion, dependence? Dependence. Or was it a desire to manipulate him, or a desire to possess him as a man, or a desire to possess him as an object, a thing? Meaning, you wanted this to be yours. Possession. Yes, it was a desire to possess. A desire of manipulation. Yes, definitely. Or to put it simply, his submission to you. Yes. And what did you feel at that time? Well, she might not remember now, but as a rule, at such moments when you talk to people immediately after such attacks, and in more detail according to the energy structure, they always feel as though something is entering them from the back of the head, like that very shadow or something else let's say, alive, or energy, or like when one feels a stream of light, so to say, but of dark kind. It's as if entering one from the back of the head and in a downward direction, and then this compression starts, this thirst. Well, this reaction appears immediately, then consciousness, it erases everything. Here is another interesting thing. If a person hasn't analyzed what had happened, very often consciousness simply erases such things. Why does it rub things out? Well, from a psychological perspective, we can say that our organism tries to replace all the stressful situations, leaving only good things. Well, there is such an approach. I'll ask everyone in the room, whoever wants it, who of you can remember your life in detail, but only good memories? I'm sorry for the expression, but only crap comes to mind. That's how our consciousness works. But psychologists tell us everything in quite a different view. They tell us that a human memory remembers only the good. No, guys, it just cannot be so. Because our consciousness, it is kind of that very part of memory and everything else. It implants and manipulates only the bad. Why? A person has to be nervous. He must produce emotions. He must feed his consciousness. Through consciousness, the system feeds itself. How huge is the system? Well, the universe, it is the system itself. We should understand this, and we've already talked about it many times, that if we break it down to the level of the azosmic grid, which we are all passing through, meaning every phantom of our body, of our consciousness, it is also a component of this world. And all this wants to eat, all this is eating. And considering the fact that this power, this energy, which is generated by a human being, meaning that alat, or that power which everyone hunts for, is able to influence many things and change a lot in this material world. Well, this power doesn't come so easily to these systems. After all, it's the power that is given for life. First of all, 
For life of a human, why? Because a human being is not only spiritualized, he is also soul-filled. And since he or she is soul-filled, it means there is a part of that source in human being, via which this power enters this material world. And naturally, it is being hunted for. Simply because they want to live. Well, let's say, a car won't run without the gas. We have to fill up the car to drive it. So these beings also have to fill up somewhere in order to live. We showed the example with skyfish and the like. Why do they fly around in one place? Have you noticed there's just one camera? Because our guy whom we asked, he was sitting and putting all this together, one shot at a time. It was very convenient for him to observe through this camera. If he was observing through another camera, the whole lot of skyfish would be on that other camera. Why? He puts the power of his attention into this location. Naturally, he is already intentionally looking and thinking about skyfish. Naturally, he serves them a dish to choose from. His attention is nothing more than a commodity. Well, thank God, quantum mechanics shows, demonstrates such abilities, observations or not observations, of how electrons travel. Everything depends on this. And all magic, it is built on this. The more you give, the more you get. But magic has a flip side too, you get something other than what you ask for. In the spiritual development, these powers, I will digress a little, they are given to people for their liberation, for gaining life. That very sexual energy is again for origination of life. Why? When there comes a surge of sexual energy, the powers of Alat follow it. After all, these powers, they should theoretically give an impulse towards a new life, contribute to its origination and continuation. Well, this is exactly what they hunt for. We often waste it all, say, for nothing, in vain. There is a lot of this power. Well, there's food and there are those who eat. Well, we are just about to… Our operator had a similar situation as we showed previously. But he couldn't concentrate and summon forth this incubi to feed them. Well, there was something, and thank God. But in fact, if at that moment we would have filmed our person who is telling all this, or at least the operator, under the right conditions, we would have seen the shadows that are approaching and steering. There's a lot of them out there. That's why a person must develop spiritually in order to be free, otherwise it's not freedom. Consciousness says that you're free, that you can make a choice. You can. But within the framework, strictly limited by these creatures and consciousness, should you step aside, it will tell you something completely different. But when a person, while liberating himself spiritually, evolves and begins to feel all this, to understand and see, and to make a really free choice, whom to feed and whom not to feed, and what consequences await him after such feeding, well, in any case, it's fair in my opinion, if a person purposefully exchanges immediate gains for the eternal future, for that happiness, for that love which is genuine. Well, this is his personal choice and no one can contradict here. If you want to live by material things, exist for a short period of time, if you want to gain life eternal, gain it. But you have to fight for it. It's never that simple. And this is what we are trying to explain. That's what we are trying to convey to you guys by telling and showing you. Well, why? Because there's too much information going around. Well, and we are born in such conditions of an informational overload, where the truth is modified, it is substituted. I told you about Baraka in the previous program, mentioning his omnipotence treatise and the like, and how all of this gets modified, how true knowledge over the years is replaced even by those who must keep it all safe. That is, thousands of years have passed and only magic has remained of the truth. And this is how it happens. But on the other hand, we can conduct a simple experiment. I'll tell, let's say, a story to Andre, and he will tell it to Anna. Well, and so on up to ten people. Then the tenth person will tell me the exact opposite, won't he? He will. What is passed through consciousness, especially regarding spiritual or some deep things, true things, it is all changed, it is all substituted. This is the purpose of existence let's say, of that very consciousness. It keeps us within strict limits, although, on the other side, again, people can say that I'm not right, since consciousness is nothing more than what makes us humans. It must be at our service, it must be. But, in fact, we are at its service, like a cow or a sheep. 
These are the realities of life. That's why one shouldn't get carried away. Sorry, I've digressed. Right. Concerning possession, yes, it was exactly such a desire. I've just realized. Desire for power. A very strong desire to possess that person, and at the same time all kinds of negative emotions possible, became more acute. It was jealousy and envy and all sorts of things. Meaning I, and also there was a very strong emotional attachment to him. That is literally, when he would leave my sight, let's say, I don't know, we would part for the night. Yes or for some time, but I felt so bad inside that I couldn't even understand why that was. Well, I mean, and really, indeed, there was such an impression that when he left, my life was over, because I remained alone, on my own, with all that emotional bundle that, that was there. And what else was there? Oh, and also the same thoughts were spinning around. I mean, I was surprised. Well, how was it possible? I had such an impression that, well, I went to work, lived my life, but still, there was something like a mental cage I couldn't get out of. Pardon me, here is the key point. Again, which of you has an experience, an obsession of a thought? A thought is not yours, you haven't ordered it, you don't want it, but it comes and it keeps spinning and it dominates all day long, especially if it's negative. Well, positive thoughts, they don't keep spinning, they give the light well and they are scarce, but negative thoughts, especially if you're useless, you're worthless or you are being cheated or anything else, well, just all negative stuff. And all this negative stuff, it goes round and round in people's heads. Tell me, if you're free citizens, let's say, and you possess consciousness, you are kings of nature, then there is a simple question. Why do you order such thoughts that eat you? It's a simple question. Do you need them? You don't. You suffer from them. So why do you allow them to stay? in your head all the time. Don't we live that way? We are living in our fantasies, spinning in the head all the time. We speak with someone we don't see. We communicate with someone we don't know. We desire something we don't need at all. But we think that this is happiness, as if once we achieve that, we will be happy, we achieve that. And where do we stay? Again, nowhere. Because whatever you achieve here, You will still be unhappy. Our idea of happiness is determined, has been determined by our ancestors. A house, a family, children, prosperity, health. But even those people present here who have all of these, are they happy? By the human standards, yes. And internally, no. Yet why are they then? Why are people so sad when they find out that their bodies should die soon? What is the reason of sorrow? And what is the reason of sadness that one hasn't done anything? And why in the old age all that's left for us is to tell our grandchildren or kids about what kind of heroes we were, right? About what we have built, have done, something else. But we have nothing to tell about tomorrow, because we don't have tomorrow. Subpersonality has only the past by which it will live and be guided for the rest of its life, living through those dirty emotions. And so notice, in fact, our thoughts, most of them, they are negative. 90% of thoughts during the day, it's safe to say, they all are just negative. The one who irritates us and causes a certain emotion, some argument, some dependence. Again, an emotion, it spends these powers, throws them away and consumes. And consciousness, let's say, as a part of the system, well, along with lots of others, quite intelligent beings hiding in the shadows, do so. Let's take those very skyfish, for example. They need something to eat. And neither a cow nor a goat can be food for them. Why? Because they, yes, they are non-material structures. It means that since they are non-material, they are more energy-like, let's say, some creatures. It means they should eat what? Something similar to them, right? Our bodies are material, we eat material food. Well, I can't imagine how we can stuff a piece of sausage into a skyfish, understand? Well, here, this is worth thinking about. Well, and again, they are able to eat only when we generate negative emotions, when we discharge like battery, but when we accumulate energy, when we strive for the sun, then where the sun is, there are no shadows, trust me. That's why, guys, we need to become sunshines.
And if a thought keeps creeping into your head, you should understand that if you haven't ordered it, if you are not a masochist and you don't want to think about negative things, well, why do you need it? It's very simple, in fact. Well, make your consciousness think about positive things. In other words, don't invest attention and any thought will stop at once. Don't play along with those actors in your head and everything falls back into place, isn't it so? Well, it is. But nevertheless, we are prone to masochism. We've taught our pets and we feed them. We also feed fish, once as we feed dogs, and in addition, we feed plenty of creatures with ourselves. Well, it is normal. Sorry, I've interrupted you, we have got off topic. And in the end, everything came to the fact that somehow all of this was building up, and the further it went, the worse it became for me. Well, there came a period in my life when I woke up in the morning and couldn't understand how I was still alive, meaning I had a feeling of complete devastation, and I couldn't understand why I was still getting up and how I could live if I felt completely empty inside. And I will answer this question. It is rare that such people are killed, that is, deplete them of all their power. Why? A hen that lays eggs, well, in very rare cases is killed. People only kill it out of starvation or foolishness, right? If it is able to lay eggs, then it is fed and kept supported, just like a cow. Well, who would bring to slaughter a cow that gives a lot of milk? Well, only in exceptional cases. Well, it turns out that it was due to the fact that I continued to perform practices, yes? Absolutely right. You performed the practices, redirected the energy, received less yourself, and you were depressed because of this. That is, you were being eaten. Yes, well, and also I tried to figure out what does their arrival depend on, what was I provoking them with. I also noticed that manifestation of these creatures occurred when I was investing attention into something material. Here, for example, I even had a situation when I wanted to buy a tablet and I spent the whole day choosing one. Well, it seemed like a casual situation in general, and it was a typical desire, kind of unnecessary as well. But nevertheless, this creature came to me at night again, and there was a… well, yet I still wanted to. Again, we want to acquire something, we need something. We understand this, we know this, and we go and purchase it. If we can't do it now, then we plan it to do it later. And that's it. But when we imagine that we are holding this tablet in our hands, that we are browsing in it, reading something, googling something, and watching something, then, guys, it's already magic. We're playing with a picture that doesn't exist. And naturally, you input the power of your attention to it, and naturally, you attract. Everything is simple. I also noticed that my dreams had changed. Some kind of situations began to happen in my dreams as well either involving fear or something again associated with dreams of erotic nature began. Well, certainly. And there was a distinct feeling that those characters that came to me in my dreams, I actually knew in my sleep that it was a conscious person. A conscious being, I mean, it wasn't an image in a dream, but it was a conscious object of some kind. Naturally, the one that possesses consciousness, and most often there's someone standing behind this being, the one who actually controls these shadows that come, because they're just mediators. There was also an interesting point. I even noticed that, for example, at night I'm having a dream where they try to manipulate me into something, but the image is not suitable. I mean, it's a repulsive character in my dream. The next night there is another image. That is, this lasted, for example, for a week. And it was as if, you know, the images were being picked. Like, which one would work out eventually? Naturally, the system is intelligent. Yes. Since this whole interaction takes place at an informational level, through consciousness, then naturally it all becomes absolutely real. And here notice that when such dreams come, and many people do watch them, because they are very realistic, they're very emotional and such dreams, they really exist. And when a person gets up in the morning, he is not quite healthy, just like Lilia is telling. That is, there is no complete rest. You can also notice that when a person goes to bed, dreams are intermittent, a person gets up not rested. Well, guys, then someone visited you. It is very simple and easy to track. Well, such manifestations, they were the most vivid. So, basically, this is interesting. I would like to hear comments from our psychotherapist. I think you have faced this more than once. 
Yes, nowadays there is a big problem that has to do exactly with fantasizing, and no attention is paid to it at all, meaning it is not considered to be some kind of pathology or a problem at all, meaning it is considered to be normal and exactly such erotic sexual fantasizing, and then it all develops into obsessive ideas. Well, that's what it's called, what Lilia has described, what lots of people face, that it is OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. There appear obsessive thoughts, fantasies, ideas, and compulsions, meaning a desire to implement all this. When a person, well, as it is explained in that very psychology, when he doesn't have a possibility to implement this, he starts having fantasies about it. And here we have a question. A human being has plenty of opportunities to implement this, and she fulfills her own sexual desires regularly, almost every day. But the more often it happens, the more severe the obsessive states are. That's absolutely right. This also can be attributed to neurosis, certain states that are hidden precisely in psyche. But many other things can't be explained, unfortunately. And on top of that, nowadays all of this has become much younger. If before, for example, it wasn't observed in children 10 years old or younger, today people come with kids who are 7 and 8 years old. And indeed, it is starting to happen out of nowhere. These are the pictures children see. For example, a 7.5-year-old girl was telling that these bright images and fantasies came to her, that she, well not she, but another child, was being undressed and put on the knees. She is crying and saying, I can't get rid of this, I don't want it. And at the same time, she feels sexual arousal at that moment. She likes that, yet she feels awful that she likes that. She is ashamed, she feels guilt and fear because of that obtrusiveness, and at the same time, she suffers from that state. And when we were already clarifying this point, what it had started after, some girl, when she was little, she was barely six years old, that girl told her about sex, so later she started having this kind of fantasies. At the beginning, these were fantasies, it was harmless. Also, it's not a secret, but it's not talked about, that children, even such little kids, they engage in masturbation, meaning self-pleasure, that is at five, six, seven years old. Well, people have to tell the truth, because at the age of five, six years old, there precisely happens the primary surge, the primary sexual surge in children. And here's where various manifestations begin, which later on, as fellow Freud used to say, dictate the whole life, right? Right. It's conditions to a person. But, in fact, when these primary surges occur, these are the most powerful outbursts. It's exactly here that the system gets interested in children. And for many kids, life turns into hell at times. Excuse me, may I just add? I've just realized that I have missed an important point in my story that when this creature came to me for the first time, right before that moment I was doing just that. I mean, it turns out that I had performed a practice involving sexual energy, and it was as if I had such a feeling that there was a lot of this energy, and I kind of wanted to get a release. And so I started masturbating. It was like one, two, three, four, five times, and then sometime after the sixth, there happens this very energy strike. Well, I'm not a good fisherman, but I often go fishing. Well, from experience of others who catch fish nearby, I know the better they feed, the more fish come, right? The same with birds, the more grains we strew, the more birds come. Here's the answer. I've got it. I called it myself, yes? Of course, we ourselves call them. After all, no one will come against your will and knock on your door until we open it. It is really the case. No one ever breaks the law. If you are not ready, and if you don't wish it, sorry, no demon, no devil, regardless of who says what, it won't come to you. It will come only when you have betrayed God. Once you betray Him, well, of course, you open the door wide to every evil. Well, from here it all begins. But we have, excuse me, a lot more fun. We only say that we must be good, must be patient, must be humane. And who in their family is patient towards one another? There's forced, yes, cohabitation, coexistence in the family. We tolerate each other because we are dependent and have adapted. And what's next? Well, are we afraid to talk about it? We are afraid. This topic, that God forbid, 
No one should ever talk about this. And at the same time, in every family, someone eats somebody else. And someone must succumb in order to maintain at least some visible order. Well, isn't that so? Well, it is so. Even from the perspective of that very psychology, is it really a normal life of free people, voluntarily? Our voluntary life is over in a year or two when, pardon me, we've already got tired playing sexual games. That's when it ends voluntarily. And while there is some activity, attractiveness to each other, the system eats, it is interested in us. Yes, things run smooth with us, we argue every day, but eventually we come to reconciliation, and then everything calms down, but we have to coexist in those conditions that we've created ourselves. But is there any light in this? Purity, goodness? Well, that sincerity, kindness? No, there still prevails selfishness, adaptation and everything else. Am I not right, guys? Somehow I don't see any objections. And then we come up with all sorts of clever names, how to insult it scientifically, and what kind of neurosis has appeared in us. And we keep statistics, we conduct conversations, give medications. But in fact, we don't understand anything and don't know what to do with this misery. Well, isn't that so? Yes. And here it is also interesting that the girl had a clear sense of someone's presence in the room, and this being mainly came to her at night, when she was already going to bed. She had been hiding this for two years from her parents, and no one knew. Children mostly hide it. Adults hide it too. Well, pardon me, adults hide it too, you're absolutely right. And here's another thing about this child. In the end, she also had a decrease in immunity, depression, and she fell ill. First, it was psychasthenia, that's what they call some kind of weakness, lethargy. And then an ordinary virus led to the child having bilateral pleuropneumonia, and they barely pulled her out of the state. And as a rule, when such a serious condition happens to a person, when he or she is on the verge of dying from some illness, then most often children start feeling better. Yes, all the fantasies ended at that. These are not fantasies. It's just that the one who implanted these fantasies steps aside. A child doesn't fantasize on his or her own. Try to fantasize, to play, yes, with your consciousness. You can rotate Rubik's cubes in your head. Peel lemons, for instance, something else. Yes, you can imagine it all, and so on. Well, let's say, you have imagined it, a Rubik's cube, you've peeled a lemon. Does it really haunt you all day long? No. Yet, why do other things haunt and oppress? That's the question. That is, where you use consciousness as a tool for something necessary, to study something, for something else, and sometimes you force it like, you bastard, memorize it all. I do need it. It doesn't want to. And again, the same goes for children. A child is learning a poem. He has read it twenty times, but can't memorize it. He's heard a song, God forbid, with a curse word, and he knows it by heart. Who is memorizing it? Is it the interest? Yes, we can explain it from the perspective of psychology. A person has put in attention something else. Yes, it is precisely an emotion. Everything is happening based on this. Influence, influence from the outside. And when, pardon me, blood just pounces off a piece of meat and it starts to attack people, what's this? Is it a virus? What kind of virus is that? When there is life in every particle of this substance, and it's intelligent, and they gather together like ants and they act, that is, what we used to call blood, it's no longer blood, it is already an organism in an organism, which controls the organism, which hunts and eats. It doesn't kill its host, but it forces its host to kill others. Meaning it is a collective consciousness of some kind? Absolutely right. Is this a virus? No, it's not a virus. When, pardon me, erythrocytes change, everything changes, absolutely everything changes. It can no longer be called blood, except that it only looks like it by color. But it can immediately become ordinary human blood. That's the paradox. And if you look at it in a microscope, there's nothing special. Ordinary blood, a human blood, a moment, and conditions change instantly. Well, in my opinion, this is an absolute Reality. Well, let's say it's worse than reality. Influence. Influence from the outside. Yes. For example, I know some people, well, we're friends, they're renowned scientists, and many of them help us carry out various experiments. But you see, they do it in such secrecy that, God forbid, if someone, a colleague at work, finds out that this scientist is connected with us, experiments similar to these are carried out. So whom will they call him right away? Isn't it a fact? Of course, all human beings ought to fight on their own, and this is a must. And it is necessary to become 
let's say, pure within, brighter and the like. But it's much better to do this in a group. I would like to raise one more topic. Come on. Let's watch a movie for a while. Why we have shown this? Admit it. We all have stereotypical directives. If any incomprehensible manifestations of these subtle beings occur, such as those which we have just been discussing, then we can have only two options to the rescue, either exorcists or psychiatrists. But practice precisely shows a totally different fact that neither of them can cope with this. Generally speaking, exorcism is an interesting thing. Everyone refers to Jesus Christ performing precisely exorcism of demons or rather evil spirits from the possessed people into pigs. But excuse me, what is permissible for Jove is not permissible for a bull. And why do other people fill someone's shoes that don't feed them? Surely, this is an interesting question. But nevertheless, today and in the past too, exorcism, for the most part, has been simply a business, a show. And as an affirmation of one's own authority, we know perfectly well that there are a lot of people with an unhealthy state of mind, let's say, who imitate a disease or possession. And the same possessed people visit different priests to exorcise demons for years. And it's good for the priests, and it is a show for people. Well, and those who undergo exorcism are also pleased. But in fact, when such phenomenon occurs, well, imagine if a person like Lilia, who has just told us about her situation, went to either psychiatrists. That's a simple question, what would you do in this case? In a classical version? In classic one, of course. Some type of medicine would be prescribed, especially since tranquilizers don't work in case of such obsessive-compulsive neuroses. So neuroleptics and antidepressants would be added as well. And what does practice show? Well, ultimately, as long as these drugs were being taken, a person would be as calm as, well… Like wood. Like wood, indeed. And later on, everything naturally would come back. So they would turn a possessed one into, pardon me… A retarded one. A retarded one, yes. A retarded one out to a retarded one. Well, it's a pity there is no priest among us. We would also ask him, what would you do? If an exorcist were here, he would say, we would recite a prayer and exorcise the demon by the word of God. Well, certainly there are plenty of attempts to do so. But the point is that orthodoxy forbids exorcism. Why? Because they say clearly that it is a show, it doesn't work, and it cannot work. As for what is shown to us on TV, well, it gives hope that if it happens to you, you would be able to go there. Lots of people go there indeed, live in monasteries for years, and so on. Well, let's say they turn this into a certain business, and such a spectacular, theatrical performance for people, for the masses. But in reality, a person will suffer as he has been suffering. No one can solve this problem for the person. This is his choice. As I've already said, it's you who have opened the gate, so you're the one to close it. No? Well, live like this if you enjoy it. As for exorcism, there is an interesting expression. Yes, I'd like to add something about exorcism. I have looked through various dictionaries, and the most interesting definition is given in the Psychological Dictionary by Kondakov. Moreover, he borrowed this definition. It is a translation from the German book, published in 1836. So, here is what exorcism is a victim evil spirits. It is based on inflicting sufferings on a sick person by the one who is a victim evil spirits. But certain conditions must be met along with that. Firstly, the exorcist must absolutely believe that the evil spirit is real. Secondly, the spirit assisting the exorcist, on behalf of whom all the action takes place, must occupy a higher rank in the demonic hierarchy than the evil spirit does. Thirdly, before evicting the spirits, the exorcist must pray and fast for a long time. It is important that all his actions while performing exorcism are directed not against the sick person, who on the contrary grows stronger in his determination to get rid of his illness, 
but against the evil spirit that is torturing him. The healing of the possessed one had a form of a physical impact on the sick person's body. Extremely loud noise, unbearable odors, bloodletting, beating, and so on, so that physical sufferings would make the evil spirit leave this body. It has been a common practice to provide a new object, primarily an animal, for the evil spirit to indwell. To put it simply, what were they talking about? In order to be able to evict an evil spirit possessing somebody, an exorcist must control a stronger spirit, or this spirit must be on his side. Or, to put it simply, the exorcist concludes a certain agreement. He can come to an agreement or to fire a subordinate with the help of a superior, meaning to evict it from the body, but in no case can he perform this on his own. Well, that's what they are talking about. But how actually can one relocate a being that is eating your attention into someone else in order to free a person from a demon? The person must choose a different position himself. When you are going towards the sun, there are no shadows. As long as you are walking into the thicket of the forest, you are surrounded by shadows. Well, I have already told you about it, but I'll say it once again, because it provides very good and full answers to the questions about all these incubi, evil spirits, demons, regardless of the ranks they hold. All this is a hierarchy made up by people. Yes, these are very strong ones, yes, do exist. And also people engaged in magic do exist, who are able to influence other people. It's true, it's physics, it's normal, it's trivial, there's nothing special about it. But, again, it's possible to affect only the one who is open to such influence. If your attention is invested only in the spiritual path, if the Sun is your only aspiration, then what shadows can we talk about? Right, guys? Right, but, on the other hand, this topic has been widely promoted well, the whole point of it is that someone greatly benefits from it. Six hundred years ago, Baraka said that the majority of non-believers were among clergy. He meant all the clergy. Andrei has some interesting statistics. He is going to tell you about it. But this statistics is absolutely unreal. In a moment, I'll clarify why. Yes. So, in year 2014, a survey among priests was carried out in England. A thousand and a half priests from England, Wales and Scotland were interviewed for the research. So, it turned out that 2% of Anglican priests don't believe in the existence of God at all. Meaning, in their opinion, the idea of God was born in a human mind. God is nothing but a human mental construction and 16% of Anglican priests doubt the existence of God. Besides, the percent of those who have doubts is higher among elderly priests. It is 90% of the clergy. Among the, so to say, newcomers, this number is about 72%. It's those brave ones who were able to speak about it. Why? Because the organization itself and its very essence, it obliges people to do and to say what they must do and say, that is, there is ritualism, eloquent speeches and so on, but they act completely differently. They tell the right things to believers, those who again aspire to join God. They tell the right things, but the history with Pharisees and scribes recurs. They themselves act in a different way, which causes doubts among people and so on. This chain continues, but nevertheless, we play this game. It's impossible to come somewhere, pray and get something. Why? Because in order not to believe, but to cognize, one needs to work a lot, first and foremost. And as a matter of fact, first of all, one should defeat all inner doubts. And everyone has doubts. After all, it's not a secret that even Saint Teresa she doubted till her last day, did Jesus really exist? It's a simple question. Nonetheless, she was canonized, people prayed to her, but she didn't believe in God. That's the point. Which of you really believe 
No, that God exists. Well, some of you keep silent, but I'm asking the others. Until you learn that this exists, you won't perceive it, and in order to cognize it, you have to believe in it. Now we are sitting in the shadow, it is evening already, there is no sun. There is the sun, theoretically, for our consciousness, we know that. But we don't see it. It's the same with God, yes, He's somewhere, we know that, but we don't see Him. Until we feel this, until we start living by it, we won't understand it, we will have doubts. And the very structure of basically any religion is built in such a way so as to give this structure possibility to exist. Well, Brahmans are certainly ahead of all. Anička, please tell us about peculiarities of Brahmans, meaning about what people miss. It's just that the Universal Grain Project has been started, and people across the world have joined it very lively, and we are very grateful to them for this. And they've started sending a lot of interesting information. Well, and here there's exactly the quintessence responding to all questions, I'd say, of human desires. And it has been voiced by Brahmans. Anička, please. That's right, indeed. When we started exploring this topic, reading ancient texts, the Mahabharata in particular, we were especially surprised by the 18th book, the last one of the Mahabharata, where it is described what honors must be given to a priest who will simply read the Mahabharata to you. That is, I'd just like to quote that. Having heard a recitation of the Mahabharata, with due devotion and according to one's power, he, a person, a king, should make unto the Brahmins large gifts and diverse kinds of gems and kind, and vessels of white brass for milk and kind, and maidens decked with every ornament and possessed of every accomplishment suited to enjoyment, as also diverse kinds of conveyances, beautiful mansions, plots of land and cloths. Animals also should be given, such as horses and elephants in rage. Whatever objects occur in the house of the foremost kind, whatever wealth of great value occurs in it, should be given away unto the twice-born. This is the second name of Brahmin. Indeed, one should give away one's own self, wives and children into slavery. That's where they hit their limit. So this is the quintessence of all priests. Not only do you give everything away, but also give your family and yourself into slavery. This is what human consciousness actually dreams of. I'm by no means against religions. I am for religion. Religion is needed and it does a lot of good. There must be at least some moral and ethical limits for people. After all, it's important. But the fact that main things are not done, just because there is no belief in God and no knowledge of God, is the truth. You can't get away from it. As to what controls people, those who stand, let's say, on the other side, right? It is exactly these usual trivial human desires that they are controlled by. So this is how consciousness dictates to them. I'd like to recite more. Further, there is such an example about sacrifice rituals. They really are… their structure is built so as to involve as many priest Brahmins as possible, that is, relatively speaking, every step in the ritual requires a separate Brahmin. I'd just like to read out which priests are generally needed in priestly sacrifices. For example, so, Hatar, the chief priest, for Shastar, the first assistant of the chief priest, Nashtar, a priest who brings the sacrificer's wife to the sacrifice, another priest who purifies the Soma juice, a special priest who lights a fire, Agnid, and for Shastar, the householder priest of the king. Therefore, they have organized everything so that a different person is responsible for every little detail during the sacrifice. Thus, he is kind of well set up for the future. And I would also like to point out how controversial this information is. In other words, we have just described what should be brought to a Brahmin for sacrifice. But actually, just a few books before, in that very Bhagavad Gita, which is a part of the Mahabharata, it is described what a Brahmin should be like, that he should be a calm-hearted, should keep his composure and practice asceticism. And so, after this, a question arises. And which religion doesn't have it? It is said everywhere that a priest must sincerely serve God and so on, right? Meaning… If you crave for profit, you won't come to God. But it is not mentioned anywhere that a priest should go and work for his piece of bread or a chain on his neck, right? If he wants so. He has earned it, put it on and wears it. And there's nothing wrong. He has earned it with his own brain, his own hands. But he serves God all the time. Whereas in his free time, he goes and earns his bread. And the most interesting thing is that Brahmins cursed gods. And there's nothing more to add. Well, meaning where is spirituality there? Right. And this is absolutely ridiculous. And people were afraid of a Brahmin because he could curse a god Indra, for example, and Indra would put some bad curse on you later on. Right. That's why, in order not to make Indra accidentally resentful at you, you should first please the Brahmin so that he wouldn't accidentally curse Indra. That's right. If you pray to some god, 
Then you must pray with the Brahman's permission. You must please the Brahman, then he will allow you. Well, this, I actually think, perfectly shows everything. But those who profess this religion actually relied on other things. After all, those very Brahmans told them completely different things. What Anishka has just said, that a Brahman must be pure. First of all, the ascetic and everything else. However, you have to give your wife and children, go into slavery yourself, give everything and serve him. Well, where is asceticism here? And so the question is, what does a Brahmin need all this for, a person who serves God, meaning whose goal is really… Simply put, I'm actually interested. Suppose a person sacrifices to God. What can you sacrifice to God? Well, I took money and gave it, or I went, bought a cow and gave it. But does he need it? What's the point of all this? It is indeed so, it is mentioned in scientific works. Right, and if a Brahman has read to you… Exactly so, yes. …something from a scripture, this means that you are already saved. If you have given everything away, you will be saved, won't you? Yes, you will. No, you will not. That's the trouble. If you don't make efforts, if you don't work on yourself, if you don't oversee your consciousness, if you don't accept God here, then He won't accept you there. And this is the truth. And no matter how someone calls it, or how they twist it, this is the truth. It is one for everyone. It has been from time immemorial, and it will be, and so it will remain, no matter what and how people say, no matter what they prove. This is the truth. In order for a person to feel God's love, he himself should learn to love first. If he doesn't give this love, he won't receive it either. That's the point. No one has ever managed to break this rule, and no one will ever be able to. Maybe anyone has any questions, since we have been discussing such a sad topic today. Go ahead. May I ask a question? It's just in the context. Often people, while trying to cope with some sort of obsessions, either fears or it doesn't matter what, obsessive thoughts, and people do spiritual practices or practice some prayer states, and so, as they explain it, they get into a vicious circle. Meaning, while doing a practice, there is literally such an intensification of these… a game of imagination. These thoughts come right up to the point of causing sensations, physical sensations. And it turns out that in order to get out of this state, they understand that they need to become stronger in spirit, stronger as a personality, a more mature one. But consciousness controls them. Yes. Why? Because consciousness always strives for physical manifestations. We even conducted various experiments and so on. Why go far? Let's take the pyramid, for instance. When people send feedback on the pyramid experiment, whether it can have a positive effect or not, they say nothing supernatural has happened. Meaning, people's consciousness is tuned to see with earthly eyes and to perceive physically, meaning, Spiritual practices, what, what do they give you? What have you obtained? A house, a car, do tell. What has it given you? Has your health improved or anything else? That is all material. And if you haven't got anything material, it means all this is nonsense. You must acquire, you must become healthier, incurable diseases must go away. Then you are saved. Guys, I have a simple question. Okay, a person got sick. Yes, the illness is severe and leads to a lethal outcome. The person prays for the salvation of his health, and his health is restored. Has he got saved or actually killed himself? This is a simple question. After all, what has he asked God for? Instead of eternal life and spiritual salvation, he has asked for something material. Will God hear this? A simple question. Well, then how else to convey an understanding that consciousness is not a friend. And when a person is performing a spiritual or prayerful practice, regardless of which religion he belongs to, he is performing a certain ritual. If he performs it with consciousness, caring about some trifles, but he doesn't have inner spiritual love, there is not this feeling, not this unity with the world of God, then all these guys, well, I'm choosing a civil word to call it. Well, it's a waste of time. Self-deception. 
It is a hope for something that is not going to happen. And this is for a person to stop doubting and stop hoping that when passing away he should confess, perform some ritual, and this would help him to pass into the world of dead or something like that. One should pass into the world of the living, not the dead. We are already in this world. In fact, we don't need to live to the world of the dead. Well, that's another topic. And in order to gain life, you should gain it here and now. And every person has this chance, and everyone is capable of it. The only thing is that you shouldn't want anything from anyone. You need to work yourself and be sincere and be honest with yourself. Who among you does not deceive oneself, guys? Well, constantly, right? When you perform spiritual practices, consciousness is helping, it immediately starts to peg when a person attains something, when he starts to… when there's a perception through feelings, when he really comes into contact with something that consciousness doesn't know, and consciousness doesn't know the spiritual world and won't be able to cognize it, it is just consciousness. But it immediately revolts and begins to criticize and say, never will you achieve anything, you are not worthy, all this is nonsense. It starts to suppress a person, why? Because it's convenient. After all, self-criticism, self-accusation are those very hooks by which it grabs this carcass and drags it to the grave. Isn't that so? Yes, it is. Well, I have already said a hundred times that for consciousness, the state of subpersonality, or what we call hell in religions, is more acceptable than a spiritually saved person. When a person gets spiritually saved, leaves this perishable world and passes into another state, then not only does matter collapse, but consciousness as a part of the material world ceases to exist. And since consciousness identifies itself as Self, it is fatal for it, it is death for it, and that our emotions, everything else, are nothing but the work of our consciousness, isn't that so? It is. Hence emotions, hence outbursts, hence constant consumer attitude towards an individual as a personality from consciousness itself, which oppresses, diverts, and the like. Who of you hasn't experienced, I mean, out of those who practice or believe, regardless of which religion, when the time comes for namaz, prayer, or the time for performing a spiritual practice, consciousness starts saying, no, don't do it, it distracts, you will do it later, or rejects it. A person is walking, a religious person passes by a temple and crosses himself, but he won't enter, he has plenty of time, he doesn't know what to spend it on, and his consciousness redirects, it says, but you will go on Sunday, you'll stand in front of your neighbors and show your spirituality. That's the point, to show spirituality, but not to be spiritual. This is true. There is no escape from this. Again, regarding rituals, well, rituals, I wouldn't say that this is bad, they took up time with rituals. Just imagine, what is a spiritual practice? It is a unity of a human being with God. No matter how many of us get together, we are still one-on-one -on -one with God. We communicate with Him at the level of feelings, at that which is invisible. When people come, and so a clergyman should well, there he would be sitting silently, and so people would say, what have we come for? Back then, when they began to substitute the knowledge with all religious actions and introduced rituals, they also introduced this performance so that a person would get imbued with it. On the one hand, they justified it by explaining that specifically when there's pomposity, when there's performance, a person gets captivated and all that. His consciousness, kind of, gets carried away by completely different pictures, and there is an opportunity for the spirit to come into contact with the spirit, so to say. But in fact, it just diverts, distracts attention and attaches one to something else. Therefore, there are some religions where there are a lot of rituals, everything is very colorful, there are very humble religions that are more directed towards the inner. Let's take Islam, right? There's nothing like that there. People come and pray. They're one-on-one -on -one with God. They also read certain prayers and so on. But anyway, everywhere there's a certain ritual, certain dogmas, and a certain subordination to someone. It is wrong to criticize the words said by a spiritual mentor, that is, he knows more and better and the like. On the one hand, when a person embarks on his journey and consciousness hinders him, then of course experience and practice mean a great deal. But there can't be such a concept of unconditional obedience. A person himself chooses whom to be and how to exist. If we start to obey, well, let's take Andre, we all know he's a wonderful person. Should all of us start obeying him right now? Guys, in a year we'll have a dragon, believe me. 
Yes, even without that. Yes, even without that. He's playing around. Yes, yes. Even without that, sometimes we have to... Yes. And in a year, there will be a tyrant. There will be... We've been there already. Even here, in our organization, we know if a person starts to be praised, he starts becoming precisely one of those who hide in the shadows. Why? By trying to shift responsibility for ourselves onto someone else, we create a monster out of him. One shouldn't create monsters, but should be responsible for oneself. Any more questions? I have a question, probably it's off the topic. Some time ago, I received as a gift, let's say, a degree of freedom and some insights. And after a while, I felt that this connection was lost. And moreover, it seems to me that my position as of a personality has become even weaker than before. And look, what's the point? Constant self-evaluation by whom? I've just been telling how our consciousness criticizes and belittles us. If you have acquired something connected with the spiritual world, something, understanding, love, that happiness, that infinity, how can it be lost, you see? You can lose, well, I don't know, a pen, something else, but it's impossible to lose God if you have found Him, whereas consciousness can never find Him. Yet who evaluates all this in you? Who benefits from telling you that you as a personality are a worthless creature, that loses all the time, that is dependent and so on, the one who manipulates you? Isn't that so? Well, tell me, would personality drive you to an iceberg? <laughs> well, for those who don't know, it's not funny. And to volcanoes. And to volcanoes. Erupting ones. To an erupting volcano. Yes. The question is asked precisely by the one who loves icebergs and erupting volcanoes. Let's put it this way. Yes, well, everybody has a hobby, right? I think I have answered your question. No, there is nothing wrong with traveling. On the contrary, it is interesting and good, especially because you convey information to people about those places where they wouldn't voluntarily go themselves. Your photos and videos are beautiful. They give us an understanding of what one shouldn't do, or rather, where one shouldn't go. Just kidding. Questions, guys? In the pyramid practice, a couple of times I observed that when I was in a bad state, something came out of me, like a shadow or… In the beginning, consciousness was telling me it was a lie. Well, I see. This is exactly what we've begun our conversation with. When people start doing spiritual practices, they begin to notice a lot of various manifestations and phenomena around themselves and so on. Consciousness revolts and doesn't perceive this. But how can it not perceive if you see that it's moving? Right? If you feel that it was inside of you and then it left. Well, should one go to a psychiatrist or to a priest for exorcism? But if it has left, why go to them, right? One should save money. One can save on the psychiatrist as well. If it has left, why bother? But if it has entered you now already, you got to decide what's better, to run to them or bury it yourself. This is normal, it's a natural process. The world is much more complex than it seems to us, that's why it should be studied and studied thoroughly. But not just the world, one has to start with oneself. That's normal. Any more questions, guys? Recently I had a dream, and in this dream I also felt as if there was a kind of pressure from behind, and I managed to observe the process. And I associated it precisely with the work of the back essence. Well, it's not clear. After all, the pressure that was mentioned was from behind from the back of my head. Well, that's sort of how it felt. How to understand what it was? What's the difference what appears in dream? I like these kind of questions, most of all. Yesterday I had such a dream, tell me what it means. Sorry, I'm not kidding around, I'm quite serious. Sleep is… There are too many functions in it, in sleep. Actually, at the moments of waking up, when consciousness is turning on, various fragments and all kinds of mixes appear. It doesn't always carry a meaning, you see. And when people start trying to analyze those dreams, which they didn't get answers to during sleep, then, well, that's kind of a waste of time and energy. That is, I'll put it simply, one shouldn't invest attention into that which is empty. Why? Because sometimes there are dreams that are absolutely real. 
they're realistic, they're lifelike, and no questions come up as to why this happens. Please note, we've all had these dreams. Something crazy is going on, but you know for sure and understand why all this is happening. That's a normal dream. Meaning, naturally, at the time of activation of personality and consciousness, precisely this action, when we start waking up, or awakening as it's also called, of course, a lot of dreams might be flashing by at these moments. But we always understand and know the answer during sleep. In the same way, you also know the answer why there was a pressure somewhere during awakening, during your sleep. But if you wake up and continue to analyze it, well, it means that consciousness wanted it so. Here's one more difference. Consciousness always tries, even a spiritual practice. For instance, a person has felt something, has realized something, but consciousness tries to analyze it and give it a logical explanation. But when a person is performing a spiritual practice, he understands everything. Or when a prayerful state comes, when it really comes over a person, as they say, the Holy Spirit descends, meaning the person has a holistic comprehension. And then, after returning to a so-called normal state of a natural human, a mortal one, Consciousness naturally begins to analyze it all, well, to rearrange it in its own way, in order to convince Personality that it was all nonsense. And here a lot of various doubts arise, did it happen or did it not? And here's where Personality has a choice whether to listen to Consciousness and its denial of everything spiritual, or to live by the spiritual because it does exist. Everything is simple. Any more questions, guys? Excuse me, I have a question about working in a group, if I may ask such a question. There's a group that practices on a daily basis and tries to do it seriously. Are there any recommendations on this or should they follow their intuition? Yes, there are. Remember one thing, the group is you. The more serious your attitude towards yourself is, the better the group will be. Especially if everyone in the group has the same attitude. That is, the spiritual path is not a game, it's not playing around, it's life. And when you take this and yourself seriously, the group will be fine too. If someone doesn't want to, follow the spiritual path, but he likes being in a group, which often happens. Because consciousness always interferes in all holy matters, let's put it this way. Well, demons like to interfere in God's affairs and to control this process. Well, there's nothing to worry about, that person will live by himself if he doesn't improve. It's okay. But remember one thing, don't judge anyone in the group or anything like that. You should help, sure, but you shouldn't judge. Above all, you need to have a serious attitude towards yourself. Whereas a group is there to help, and nothing more. And when a person takes responsibility for the entire group, attends to them and observes who's doing well, who's doing badly, that one, well, it's coming from consciousness, guys, it's not even close to spirituality. This is an assessment of who I like being with, who I don't like being with, who listens to me, who obeys me, who doesn't obey. I'll interpret it in detail. That's why you shouldn't look for subordinates or for someone to obey. A group is a group. Of course, it's more fun to be together on the spiritual path. Actually, any journey together is more fun, right, Volodya? Right. Even traveling or going somewhere alone is boring. It's more fun to do it with someone. Is it possible to share the experience of adolescence with regard to the theme of sleepwalking? And yet I don't understand completely what it is. Or rather, I suspect… What is sleepwalking, right? Yes. But let's ask the psychiatrist. Well, I know what sleepwalking is. Well, no. The classical version? The classical version. Sleepwalking, in its classical version, is an altered state of consciousness which occurs in a certain phase of a person's sleep. Let's say he… Control motor activity, yes, without realizing the process. And he can even say something… Of course. …go somewhere. But he doesn't realize this and often doesn't remember after he wakes up. Substitution of Personality. That is, consciousness is active, but personality is not, and that's all, to put it simply. And he can even speak other languages. What's the difference? This is, by the way, an interesting point. What's the difference? After all, there's actually one language. Any more questions, guys? As to what was said about incubi, recently I've also had this experience. It happened in a lucid dream, too. And I had a feeling that there was no one who could help. As soon as I returned, I didn't immediately write it down. Really, it's not a very good feeling. 
Are there those who help on the other side? A conductor who helps to return to the soul? Well, conductors exist in electrical engineering. It's a joke. I understand your question. And look, you repeat what I've already answered to, that is, we have already discussed all these phenomena. I have a question to you. And what is it? You said a lucid dream. What is it? You were practicing a lucid dream, and then incubus came to you. Well, yes. And what is a lucid dream? What were you doing? Tell us in more detail, because people are interested. Sometimes it happens that, especially in the morning, sometimes at dawn, or when I've woken up and fallen asleep in the morning, it turns out that I'm aware that I am dreaming. That is, I can... You're trying to control a dream. I'm trying, yes. And at this time, something came that started controlling you. Yes. Well, here again, who is trying to control a dream? And what are these games for? People often ask why we spend so much time sleeping. Guys, you need to rest. And personality should have rest from consciousness. Sorry, but to control a dream is to be in connection all the time. What will we come to? Will we come to anything good? No, we certainly won't. When a person stands firmly on the spiritual, even during a dream, then whatever comes to him, everything is clear. Isn't that so? Just tell it to go away. I don't have time for you now. Yes, I don't have time for you now. Just get lost and that's it. Meaning, personality anyway retains 100% control if it is in spiritual connection with the spiritual world, while all these are games of consciousness, sunshine. Isn't that so? It is. Yes, it is so. That is, again, you were playing with dream control in order to gain some magic abilities, correct? Yes. Well, you have gained them, enjoy. In a dream, at least. Of course, well, hasn't it come? It has. What you had called for is what came. And then what? Should you be upset about what you got? Well, now the second question. That was a joke, of course. All this is unpleasant. But we all play with what we don't know. And when we get what we wanted, it's not always joyful. Because we don't know what to do with this misery later on, you see. Say, I wanted mittens, but was given an elephant, damn it. I wanted mittens with elephants. Well, we must clearly express our wishes. The system doesn't understand jokes. What's the point? Are there those who help people on the invisible side. I will respond this way, I wish there were a lot of them. We are striving for this to happen. But we have what we have. Why? I'm asking everyone a simple question here. Because you resist and don't want it. Because you listen more to consciousness. Because you have other values. Or am I wrong? That's the point. But the more there are of those who would help others, the less people would need your help. Something like that. Any more questions, guys? Igor Mikhailovich, then there's a question in addition to my previous one. It certainly sounds like a joke, but in fact it is serious. What do I do to show how it should be done, but not how it shouldn't be? Just do it the way it should be. It's as simple as that. For some reason this I can't understand. Because you are trying to understand it with your consciousness. Because you always give preference to what? To consciousness, you listen to it. But you're, excuse me, not an empty bucket. You feel as well. Why are you trying to feel by consciousness? You're unable to, and you won't be able to. Whose consciousness can feel what a person perceives as personality? Well, it's impossible, unrealistic, but consciousness really wants it. It really strives and it manipulates and it does everything to impose. If it doesn't perceive something, it means that it doesn't exist. You see? That's how it is everywhere, in science and around. But if consciousness doesn't perceive something, then it doesn't exist. If we can't explain it objectively, we showed skyfish and many other things, God willing, and maybe with time gradually revealing, say, what can be told, we'll also show other things. If we show now at least some of the materials that we can't show, believe me, half of you would leave with grey hair. Well, this is a metaphor, of course. People don't get grey hair because they are frightened. But precisely due to atherosclerosis, well, it doesn't matter. But in general, your mood would be funny and your dreams would be wonderful. But everything should go in a gradual way, just to the extent people are able to perceive and in order for them to start thinking 
that there is something else, that next to the dead there is a life, and not everything we observe as living is alive. And unfortunately, not everything that is dead is dead. This is also true. Therefore, you should think, you should look, make your consciousness work exactly the way you want it to. You need to solve the Rubik's Cube, let it solve it. But when it tells you, no, it cannot be, don't do this, I'll put it simply, it's not for the devil to judge God, you see? Whereas you allow your demons, that is, your consciousness, to judge God and your path, is it possible? Here's the answer. And you understand this. You understand, but still do it. Well, there's probably such a little fear, kind of, to abandon consciousness. Yes, I indeed. How can you abandon it? This is the way of existence in three-dimensionality, elementary. We won't be able to talk to each other if you don't have consciousness and if I don't use mind, you see? This is a way of communication, a way of perceiving three-dimensionality. After all, personality doesn't perceive three-dimensionality. This is also true. People are trying to see something at the level of personality, right? That's why saints at all times said, if someone has appeared to you as an image, no matter who's appeared, your prophet or anyone else, send him away. It is Satan. He has come through consciousness. Because what personality perceives is something completely different. And note, I almost don't tell you what and how personality perceives, why, so that consciousness wouldn't have a chance to draw such pictures for you. But those who comprehend, they tell the truth, and thus when, with a person, well, firstly, when a person is just in the beginning, you feel at once about him, that a life has come, you see, without questions. Well, and secondly, it's more fun discussing it. But when people try to break through to the other side with consciousness, well, it's not very good, it's impossible. Therefore, if you want to live, just live. If you want to have fun, do have fun. But when consciousness says that this can't be, because it can't be, for consciousness it cannot be, it's right, it doesn't lie. Consciousness of any person says there's no God. Hypothetically, there can be God. Consciousness of not a single person has ever said to a single person and has ever convinced him that there's God. Why? Because for it, for consciousness, God is a genie who's obliged to fulfill all desires of consciousness. If he doesn't fulfill your desires, Say, you've got up in the morning and no one has poured coffee into your bed. This means there's no God. Do you understand? But you do want coffee in bed. You get up and the bed is wet. Here you are. Well, I mean wet of coffee. Meaning, that's it, there is God. In this case, consciousness will perceive. Just kidding, of course. But that's how it really is. Consciousness doesn't perceive. And it has to, and it must reject. While everything else is manipulation and hope for miracle, consciousness believes in miracle, magic, and strongly believes, because it knows that it does exist. Because if we take a classical approach, then our consciousness is a part of that very miracle. Do you understand? Contrary to all laws, it does exist. And it is endowed with precisely those characteristics that fit neither in classical medicine nor in physics, they don't fit anywhere. This is true. And here, as a doctor said, that a person not knowing languages in certain states suddenly starts speaking other languages fluently. Yes, it may be explained from the perspective of psychology, a person is not in vacuum, but in society, he hears other languages. People's memory is perfectly developed, just the activity of consciousness hinders. But in a state of hypnotic influence or some kind of somnambulistic manifestations, a person can freely reproduce speech in any language which he has heard. But what about ancient languages that he couldn't have heard? Here's an answer. Genetic memory. Well, then we again stumble upon it and again come to it, to the activity. As I told you about blood, right? That when a small part completely repeats the whole, and every part it connects and becomes whole. If you tear off a piece, it's one whole. You take it whole, it's also whole. If you divide it into hundreds of parts, it still remains whole. This is a paradox. And this paradox is precisely manifested, who carefully watched the previous program, the interaction of red blood cells there, remember? Yes, from a certain angle, when we remove the focus from red blood cells, then we see stars connected with each other, and that represents a whole, meaning the energy link is visible. Simply put, 
It's not a trick of lenses or anything else, it's real. In the same way, other things also happen. Questions, guys? May I? Yes. During the last meeting, when I was asking you a question, there was an urge to sort of voice one question, but a kind of self-presentation came out, mixed with boasting and such a vague. Well, we didn't notice that. I think that actually everyone noticed. That is, it seemed to me it was obvious. It was obvious to me too when I was analyzing all of that later. The first question is, why did it happen this way? And the second question, to be honest, when you were answering, I didn't hear anything, only, you know, some fragments. How to learn to hear what you are actually saying? Guys, this is actually a serious question. And the point is that consciousness often asks questions and already craves for an answer. Like in this case that we've just discussed, right? Because your consciousness wanted to hear, yeah, good boy, you're doing great. It wanted confirmation, or am I not right? But that is so, indeed. Consciousness doesn't perceive an answer which it doesn't agree with, especially if the answer is truthful. That's normal. And it starts getting blocked by the fact that the person doesn't hear. No, it's just distracted and immediately substitutes with something of its own. It doesn't listen and it's not interesting for consciousness, because it knows the answer. It asks a question simply as a formality. And it thinks of how it looks. But if absolutely right, it thinks of how it looks and how I've been perceived and how I... Say, I go to church on Sundays and put a candle for my neighbor, not for myself, not for God, but for my neighbor. That's the point. To reproach the neighbor afterwards, why have you littered at my holy place? Take your paper out of my territory. Don't you know that I go to church? I don't have a right to swear, right? Well, something like that. Igor Mikhailovich, and how can one sort of move this consciousness aside in such a situation? Just stop lying to yourself, that's all. After all, people are susceptible to lies. But when you are honest and things tried, when consciousness tells you something and you understand that it's a lie, just tell it, why are you lying to me? You'll be surprised at how it gets off. It's like schizophrenia, it starts cursing and even swearing. And people are telling, sharing their experiences. It's funny sometimes. You listen and think, well, yeah, it's time to visit Tatiana. But in fact, they're recovering, not getting sick. More questions. Does this inner need more like develop or is it always there? The need for spiritual liberation is inherent in personality. However, since it's in very difficult conditions, guys, personality knows nothing. Neither does your consciousness when it emerges, when it's born. It's a clean slate that learns everything by experience, but it has a potential. Meaning this inner potential pushes personality towards salvation. But since Personality is that very accountant who, say, gives out those powers for the work of consciousness. Well, if personality is removed, consciousness will disappear. You see, that is, it lives, well, like light from a light bulb. The energy that flows to personality originates precisely from, well, let's say in this case, a substation generates it, for example, or a generator works. So electricity comes from the generator. Let's call that world the generator, okay? So it comes to a light bulb at the start. Well, we have LEDs. Well, it doesn't matter. So it comes to the light bulb, to the filament, right? And the light already comes out of there. Do you see the connection? And the need of this filament is to come back to the part, to its generator, in order to be permanently in this bliss. That's what it is precisely. But this light, which it gives out to those who create shadows. And light does make shadows, don't you believe? Look, I'm going to show it, you see? You can see it on the paper, can't you? Here, the light has created a shadow. Here it is brighter, there it is darker. Do you see? Well, you can't see it, so I've showed it to Andre. I see it here on the screen, but fire doesn't create shadows. Personality doesn't create shadows either. But without having a certain experience, but having a desire and urge to return, Personality perceives three-dimensionality precisely through consciousness, in cooperation with it. Everything that consciousness is telling, what it is ready for, it what it sees and feels. While consciousness, as you see by yourselves, and you yourselves live in these conditions, what does it strive for? That's why we talk, we tell, we show videos. That's why we build understanding in different ways. And yet, a lot of other questions arise, you see. Although, frankly speaking, there shouldn't be any. Why? Because there are substitutions, lies, it's convenient to me, convenient to whom, convenient to consciousness. It says, I won't do this, why not do, say, 
Why not perform a spiritual practice? Why not go to a temple, not talk, not feel? That spirituality which is there, no. Let's better go play cards, I'm exaggerating now. But consciousness exactly drives and leads away from all this. And personality is in such a clamped state, informationally clamped, not enriched. And when a person performs a spiritual practice or he is indeed in a prayerful, highest state, not when he begs, give me health, a car, money, and I wish my mother-in-law would not nag at me, and all this is being addressed to God. And when he's asking like that, of course, nothing will happen. Whereas when there is sincere love, when a person is really awaking and correctly performs his prayer or his spiritual practice, then this revelation, this communication takes place. He needs nothing material, you see. And here it begins to grow. That is, precisely these moments awaken one, and they give one strength, because attention is invested, not in the external, but in the internal. And here, personality gains experience and practice, communicating with the spiritual world, while the spiritual world, guys, is boundless. This world here is precisely a slight hallucination, it's like an instant. And it may happen, so that, voila, all of the sudden the universe has appeared, you see. Well, and let's add angels here, they won't go amiss. But I'm so figuratively speaking, again exaggerating. Again, I explained this in human language, but this is nothing compared to that world. Naturally, in that world there is an understanding and knowledge of all processes. Why does personality have no questions or anything else, whatever happens in spiritual practices? It knows answers to everything. But as soon as you get out of spiritual practice, consciousness comes up with plenty of questions. What have you felt? What have you seen? And it attacks, so dictatorially, so to say. Well, sometimes even parents don't bug their children that much, asking them what was told at a lesson, you know, as consciousness does it, so insistently. And here, consciousness demands this information and then begins to tell you and retell it in its own way about what personality has actually felt, you see. Well, that's the way it is, unfortunately. Those who have experienced this, they know. But it tells things in its own way. And here's necessary to put this consciousness in its place. When it starts asking you, what have you felt there? Just ask it. Have you solved the Rubik's Cube? Have you learned English? And have you learned French? Learn Chinese if you have nothing to do, do you see? And everything will fall into place. Lay sleepers, dig holes. If there's nothing to do at all, do that even under a neighbor's fence. But at the same time, learn Chinese. Believe me, in such case, consciousness won't have any questions to you at all. Do your spiritual thing. That's how the world is arranged. Questions, guys? May I ask a question? Yes. Igor Mikhailovich, I probably, I think so, I have experienced something very intense, well, probably some kind of contact with the spiritual world. It lasted for about an hour, then I began to tell about what I felt, and it disappeared. I'm just summarizing. You started analyzing. Yes, and I can't return to this, while I don't agree to anything else. It was so intense that nothing else… I've just mentioned this. I know. That's the point. What do you mean, I can't return to this? Who is speaking? After all, what did consciousness experience at that moment? When this very contact occurred, it was exactly the contact of personality with the spiritual world. It's that happiness which you can't convey in words, right? Yes. Well, and then consciousness demanded to retell it all, meaning it began to turn this in its own way. And what did consciousness experience at that time? It experienced real euphoria. For consciousness it is, I'll put it simply, a person is paid a salary, he is paid well, $50, for example, whereas here he was given half a million at once. And again, consciousness wants to experience it, but it can't. Why? Because it has gained enormous powers, and it seeks these powers back, and keeping personality out in order to hold this personality, it begins to say, I cannot do this, but it's precisely consciousness which is active in this matter, not personality. What needs to be done? A simple example. Any prayer is suitable if a person is a believer, regardless of religion. But I'll emphasize again, not asking for anything else, but spiritual salvation. Spiritual practice, by all means, but without consciousness. Do it sincerely and simply love. If you want to receive love, simply learn to love by yourself. But don't listen to your consciousness. It won't tell you anything good, it won't tell you anything on the spiritual matter at all, and it certainly won't help. This is true. Unless you are a Buddhist, of course, there is a slightly different approach. Their goal and task is exactly a little shifted, to find peace. 
They engage in a bringing consciousness, meaning they bring it up. There is such notion as piece of subpersonality that is a sleep of subpersonality. Or put simply, personality sleeps during the state of subpersonality. Well, this is kind of in between. It's neither in hell nor in paradise. It's totally nowhere. Well, it's also good, of course, better than torture. But guys, to spend one's life on not gaining life, so much effort, hard work, for what? More questions, guys. Could you tell us about genetic memory? Does it come from subpersonality, meaning this knowledge of languages and so on? Well, it definitely doesn't come from personality. Speaking of genetic memory, our genetics is precisely a part of the material world, correct? Everything is simple, guys. What does this have to do with spirituality? Nothing at all. You see? I'll put it simply, if your father was a highly spiritual person, this will have no impact on you at all. Absolutely. Whereas, if your father was a boss or an owner of a winery, this can influence you, you see, but better of some oil-producing enterprise, then it will definitely have an impact. Igor Mikhailovich, please tell us, you've said that the situation is quite serious. How to simplify it? Which situation? Well, the situation that personality is pressured by information, that the world is like this and everything else. If we help, personality by means of consciousness will aggravate its condition. For that, there exist many different practices. This has been said a thousand times. There is such a program called Consciousness and Personality. There is exactly the answer to this question. During meetings, guys ask questions similar to several questions that have been voiced today. These questions are actually based on doubts of this kind. I once felt, but how can I return to this? Or simply a person is under permanent pressure of his consciousness, and his only questions are, what should I do? That is, there is self-pity, and questions like, how can I get out of this state, how can I feel, and so on. In fact, all people pass through this stage. Almost everyone. Yes, almost everyone. There are always exceptions. There are people who follow a straight path by leaps and bounds. But most people, of course, go through the stage of personal Armageddon in order to defeat their consciousness, to get rid of doubts. But here again we return to what? that one should be honest to the utmost with oneself. Many say, how is that? I'm already honest with myself. Where's honesty if you play with whatever turns up? What do you do all day long? Here's the answer. Self-torment, self-condemnation, games with your own consciousness, not to mention, well, that which relates to work, it's clear that consciousness must be busy with something. But apart from some kind of work being done, as regards spiritual, there is, first of all, self-judgment, from whom? From consciousness. Consciousness will evaluate the being, even if not spiritual one, but striving towards the spiritual. But guys, does it matter to me what demons think about me? I don't care what it says. Isn't that so? Same way towards yourself. Does it matter what consciousness tells you about yourself? After all, it's telling about itself in this case. And this understanding that consciousness I'm as consciousness or I'm as personality. If you perceive yourself as consciousness, then this affects you. You're affected by its evaluation, you're affected by its loss. How to return it? Well, to return. And here we already talked about this. It's precisely consciousness that strives to return to this sensation, to this perception of spiritual manifestations through feelings, not for the person as personality, but exactly for consciousness to reach the source it always tries to break through to this source, but it fails. Meaning, the hungry one always strives for food, for personality. These spiritual powers are like for a hungry one. You know, once there was a show, a hungry man is sitting, and there's a lot of food around, everyone's eating, while he's hungry, sitting behind the glass. That kind of show. Well, for consciousness, it is that very state, when you are sitting hungry, behind the glass, while there's infinity of food nearby. Well, that's the point. Of course, it... What will it say about those who eat this without measure? Well, not good things. I would also like to share my own experience, that such questions arise until a person starts working on himself. 
absolutely right. Or he listens to his consciousness and his work. It seems to him, as his consciousness tells him, that you are working on yourself all day long. But what are you doing? Self-tormenting. Anything except spiritual work on yourself. Isn't that so? It is. Yes. And here you are a hundred percent right. And it turns out that when a person starts working on himself, he just redirects the vector of investing his attention, and all these questions simply disappear. And there arise absolutely constructive questions regarding… Practical ones. Yes, absolutely. Yes, exactly practical. That's right, because here even personality, while using consciousness, initiates a verbal contact with the one who has more experience, and consciousness has to obey. And it obeys, but here the work is done with primary consciousness, secondary consciousness still remains, let's say, in freedom, just like those who hide in the shadows, and for personality it's, well, almost impossible to enslave it. Well, and it's not necessary either. It's enough, say, to bring primary consciousness to your side, right? Then there are constructive questions, then there is experience, then there is practice, and then self-torment, all sorts of comparison or anything else disappear. Why? There's no egoism. And that's where the whole work begins. When you are most critical to yourself, meaning to what consciousness is telling you, there's an understanding that you are dual, that you are a part of the spiritual world and a part of the material world. Whom will you become when you understand that you are only growing and you can only become someone, but not already are, while consciousness tells you that you already are, well, already, let's say, have achieved all the highest, which you could only achieve, right? You're already the creator of nature, the top, let's say… Of the food chain. Of the food chain, yes. Well, this is again the top of the food. It is said by the one who isn't connected with medicine, who has never looked in a microscope at what's inside a human being. Well, then questions disappear. Everybody eats one another. A human being is constantly being eaten by all, both visible and invisible ones. This is normal. But we also eat everyone, isn't that so? It is. We eat each other, first of all, and this is the scariest thing. Well, we should precisely take care of the other. More questions, guys. Earlier you've said that sexual energy leads to the birth of new life. And now the question is, how harmful it is that people, including myself, use this sexual energy not as intended, that is, not for the birth of new life, but for satisfaction of the needs of their primary consciousness. But what is harmful about it? It's normal. The question is different. Let's say it's a natural need of the human body and consciousness and everything else, and it's possible to get away from it. But is it necessary? And can it do harm? Let's say, if you treat it carelessly, it can. You shouldn't forget that there are a lot of various diseases. This is from the medical viewpoint. Therefore, you have to think to use contraception. We are definitely not going to show this. I'll put it simply, guys. What relates to sexual energies and the like, it's almost bordering magic. Let's somehow get around this issue. We are all adults here, we understand this, and everyone has the right to do as he likes and as he wants. I'm not saying that one should, well, let's say, be like monks and so on. It doesn't lead to good either. It will attack from the outside, and the system will take over. Therefore, just approach this reasonably. Generally speaking, it is said by nature, yes, this energy surge is precisely aimed at creating new life. That's how it is said. Whereas how we use it, well, this is our right, our business, our choice and everything else. So everyone does what they want on this matter. And if we put all the cards on the table, you won't learn anything good. Because I won't be able to tell you the truth. And to tell you how it can also be used, not for the intended purpose, well, many people already know or guess, so don't use it for wrong purposes. You get pleasure. Well, for God's sake, get it. The system also needs to be fed. We feed it not only with this energy, but also with plenty of our emotions, delusions and God knows what else. So there's nothing to worry about.
Any more questions, guys? May I ask a question? Please, go ahead. On the subject of today's program, first I'd like to share my experience and then ask a question. So, at the initial stage, when I just started to engage in practices approximately five or six years ago, I had such an experience. When I was sleeping and some creature, I just understood that it was some kind of a being. It seemed to be in the room with me. It came up to me, took me by the throat and spun me, raising me to the ceiling counterclockwise. I was aware of being alone. No help was coming. So I just folded my hands, made a sign of the cross over that creature three times and said, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. And then I, as if fell down from the ceiling at the same time I woke up and understood that the creature was already gone. Later on, this situation repeated itself in about a year. And well, there was another little there was another little moment later, but the first one was when there was that creature. It was very powerful and very strong. In connection with this I have a question. Please tell me what to do in such a situation and who are these creatures in general? Basically, this is the same thing as what we told about those who hide in the shadows. They have many names and they are diverse. Well, it's possible, of course, to figure out who exactly came to you, but what's the difference what that guy's name was, right? The question is different. You acted correctly, but acted based on what? Based on that, what has been said in your subconsciousness, right? Meaning a reflexive action. Immediately you're looking to Divine Powers for salvation. And here, there's an interesting paradox, that our consciousness, the primary one in the first place, when an implantation is taking place, and this is first and foremost a suppression of its will, just as during hypnosis, meaning a power that is much greater or a force much stronger than consciousness itself, it suppresses the power of consciousness and attacks the person directly, meaning it attacks the personality. And here consciousness takes the side of personality, meaning primary consciousness. And as you remember, if you watch the program Consciousness and Personality, much is said there, it's capable of taking the personality's side. That's why it retrieves this pattern to make a sign or the cross or something else. But here you can't say that the cross isn't working. It doesn't matter, after all. Muslims don't use, for example, the sign of the cross, but at the same time they appeal to Allah in such situations, and He helps them too. Meaning, addressing Divine Powers really helps. There's another very interesting method. When being attacked by any creature, regardless of whether it's incubi or like yours, such an aggressive creature, what should one do? So if, God forbid, anyone has to go through something like this, the best way is like being in lotus, the purity of love. Just open yourself in love, and you'll see how powerful this is. I mean, there's no need to hide behind a certain action, but one should immediately act from the personality, from the depth, precisely from this love. This doesn't mean to love this creature, no. You should become love yourself, and it will recoil immediately, as if, say, from fire. And by the way, after such a manifestation, as a rule, it doesn't attack again. As they say, once burned, second time doesn't want to. This really helps, but again, it's experience, practice of a person himself, if he's capable of manifesting this love. Well, basically, if a person is really capable of generating this love, well, he doesn't get attacked, of course, but anything can happen. Beggars can't be choosers, sometimes hunger makes them come out of the shadows. Any more questions, guys? Igor Mikhailovich, may I ask a question? Go ahead. What can you say about the 1st of February 2019, 11.47? Greenwich Mean Time, I assume you mean the asteroid which, as they say, is it possible? It is. Guys, everything's possible. Now, threats are coming not only from asteroids or the like, there are also climate problems. Everyone can see, we told about this in the report, God knows when, but what we mentioned is already happening now. There are certainly a lot of problems for the humankind in this case, and the year 2019 is dangerous not only because of this asteroid, trust me, there are other problems too. 
And generally speaking, humanity is at such a crossroads now. So whatever it is, guys, it isn't very good. But it doesn't mean that you should give up. Everything will be all right if people want it, believe me. More questions? May I ask such a question? Recently I've got such an understanding that without sincere desire, sincere need of coming to God, all this is actually like banging your head and consciousness against the wall, getting nowhere. And the question is how? To have this need not only for several moments, right? But how to grow stronger in this? Well, to… This question is often brought up, how to grow stronger on the spiritual path, right? How to be willing to want. How to be willing to want. Yes. Well, this question was also answered many times. Again, just don't listen to your consciousness. Consciousness doesn't want this. Not a single person wants to come to God consciously, exactly through consciousness. This is true. Everyone wants to be there, but nobody wants to. However, everyone wants to seem like, they want others think about them this way, but they don't want to be like that. That's why… However, every personality of every person indeed strives for this. The conclusion is, you should take the personality side, its needs, and be the personality yourself, but not be consciousness. And everything will be fine, trust me. It's simple, you see? It's like… It's closer to psychiatry when you have split consciousness, where one is good and the other one is bad. If you want to be bad, choose this side, reject the good one. If you want to be good, choose this side, reject the bad one. And eventually, it will be gone, as you don't use it. This is a simple way, right? The psychiatrist is deep in thought. You've got to try it, right? We'll try it on someone. More questions, guys. I was watching a movie about dog training. And the trainer said that, well, it's like analogy to how the training of consciousness works. The trainer said a very interesting thing, that one should draw certain borders for a dog. Otherwise, it becomes unstable and doesn't understand what they want from it and how to behave. That is, personality sometimes keeps consciousness on the tight leash and sometimes loosens it, and it doesn't know or have precise boundaries. I've noticed at daytime that sometimes when I'm going somewhere, a thought comes about something, and I often stop short. No, don't think about it. Think about that. You can't think this way, and… So, how can consciousness think? Where shouldn't I let it? Once again, I answered this question that consciousness should be tamed, while body should be trained. That's true. It's impossible to bring up consciousness. It's already brought up. That is, you can raise and bring up a child, but you won't be able to bring up your consciousness. First of all, who are you at the moment? And who sets all these limits and upbringing, you see? But you must set borders, meaning the red line that it must not cross. It's obligatory. It's the first thing to start with. It's a sensible and normal approach. Well, once long ago, there was a conversation on the subject similar to ours, and the circle was drawn for consciousness to do something within it, but not beyond. Meaning, it's the line which consciousness cannot cross in its desires, and control must be strict. If it goes beyond, this means everything is rejected. Actually, it's easy. You can say that it's difficult only if you haven't done it or don't have any practical experience when one works on oneself at least a little bit, it's tamed very easily, I mean, our consciousness. It's more difficult to make a bear walk on a wire and juggle something than to teach consciousness. But bears do walk on a wire and ride a bicycle. So, guys, it's easier with consciousness. More dangerous, though. More questions. I have a question on the subject of there can be just a calm state at daytime. It's absolutely calm, normal. Here consciousness starts interfering and telling me that I am not with God. I am in unclear state. I am kind of hanging and all that. May I interrupt, Alona? What does it start after? Now look. The state is absolutely nice. You're in peace. You feel good, comfortable inside. But you start doing something. 
and you pay attention to outside things, meaning, you're being fished out slowly, like a fisher is pulling a fish out. And so consciousness begins to attack when you are reaching the water surface, you see? This is a practical question, it's good that you've asked it. It's just that I very often have doubts. Like, who am I? There was already this answer, I understand. Where is the personality? Well, consciousness is thoughts, I understand. Consciousness always asks. Where am I as personality? Well, that kind of thing. Just recall the experience when there is contact with the spiritual world, that very happiness, these deep feelings of peace, of hope, or rather not hope, but peace of gaining something holistic. Then there are no questions. That's exactly right, there are no questions, that's it. That's exactly the Personality, you understand? But it doesn't want to think, and it doesn't want to go into three-dimensionality, I agree. When a person, let's say, resides in this world, and he gets this experience for the first time, the experience of the first contact of the Personality with the spiritual world, of course, all these questions are brushed aside. Of course, at this time, he doesn't want to come into contact with consciousness or anything. But the most difficult thing is to realize oneself as Personality and to stay on this position, not to lose it throughout the day and during the night as well, just to live. But to learn to live, it turns out to be difficult. This is the first experience. And later on, it's just as difficult to draw consciousness onto your side. Well, why? Because at this point there is fluctuation. Sometimes your Personality, sometimes your consciousness, and this Self is changing. Well, the psychiatrist has now assessed us. I've been assessing myself. Well, yes. I'll voice it later. So there's actually nothing complicated in this. And it's natural, it's normal. Well, here, again, if you set borders and in no case allow consciousness evaluate you, don't evaluate yourself in spiritual aspects, guys. Only what is related to spiritual development. Consciousness cannot tell or evaluate what you have achieved or who you are. Otherwise, it will tell you that you are already a Bodhisattva, that you have already merged, that you already have a cubic, triangular star shape, and you grew wings long ago. But they are small yet, they simply cannot be seen, you see? It will tell you lots of things. But this is consciousness. When a person achieves something in the course of spiritual development, these questions fall away, they disappear, just disappear. There is understanding and non-understanding, even this. There is knowledge. Understanding is all the same, understanding and comprehension. This refers to consciousness. Personality has a slightly different form. Well, again, it's easier to talk to those who have experience. It is there, you see? And there is understanding and knowledge of everything that relates to spiritual development. But again, Personality in many issues, even a developed Personality, in many issues of three-dimensionality, it simply doesn't involve in them. Why? Here, of course, primary consciousness is needed in order to have verbal communication. It's necessary to have consciousness on your side, if you already stand firmly on the position of Personality. Otherwise, it will be difficult even to communicate. This world isn't perceived, it is rejected as a foreign body. And this may already lead to the doctor again. Therefore, here, well, I mean, relatives and friends will take you there. They'll say that something is wrong with the person, therefore you mustn't lose, let's say, contact with this world. But you must remain yourself. Questions, guys? A question about practices. When I'm performing the pyramid or lotus practice, such states occur while immersing. There is as if a split, meaning on the one hand, practice is going on and I feel that. That's right. But on the other hand, I see how my consciousness is dreaming. That's right. It doesn't think. It should be so. At initial stages, it's normal, it's natural. Meaning, there happens a humanist dual, we've talked about this. On the one hand, you already exist as a Personality and you feel the practice and its work. But on the other hand, you give an assessment to consciousness that is asleep. And for consciousness, it's all like extraneous, alien, which goes like a dream or something incomprehensible. That is, it seems to be bored. And consciousness should be bored. It's something, it's sleeping somewhere. In this case, the best thing is certainly to choose the side of good, you see? That is, well, actually, whom you choose, of course. It's your choice, this is voluntary, but it's better to choose the side of Personality, and consciousness will gradually stop interfering. 
And there is another, well, let's say, stage or some manifestation. That is, it turns out that this happens, and sometimes it's like such waves of disappearance occur, like you were there, and then suddenly you are not. This is also normal. Then again, you are not. This is absolutely natural, and you shouldn't be frightened. This doesn't mean that it was sleep. This means that at that moment, while you're performing the practice, everything is going smoothly and clearly for you. But once you've got out of this practice, you realize that there were moments of blackout. These are moments of blackout for your consciousness, when you try to evaluate it with consciousness. But it's enough to relax, that is, again, to take the position of Personality, to shift yourself into Personality, and blackouts disappear. There's clear understanding of the entire spiritual practice. When, well, a human being is dual, he is still trying to sit on two chairs, that's why all this is happening. Well, this is normal. It's a natural process, it's a natural stage of development, and it's a pretty good one already. So you should do your best, sunshine, and everything will be fine. There is one more question concerning your initial stories about spirits and about other beings. In a state when I'm falling asleep or waking up, there are such even during sleep, there are such states when it seems as if you are falling asleep, but they don't let you drive into it, they really don't. And there is a push, as if consciousness is returned into the body by someone, or how to express this correctly, I don't know. And this push comes from the outside, just like the one that was described from the middle gate, like this. Between the shoulder blades. As if Lotus explodes at this moment. Between the shoulder blades. Yes, and as if you, I don't know, I call it as if you were pushed back into the body. And there is such a state that it's impossible to fall asleep all night, because it constantly returns. Well, again, why is this happening? Because there's someone nearby who wants to eat very much. What should you do at this moment? Just as I have told Constantine about this, Again, this is the practice. Dive in love and everything will disappear. And the sleep will be great, believe me. Although it's better not to believe. To believe is like the last thing to do, you know? Try it. Gain your experience. Apply this practically. And also, the last question, based on these states which happen at night, of such kind. There is such a state when you are dreaming, well, that's like, I don't know, you're in a dream and you realize that this is not a dream, meaning you already understand this, that is some kind of action takes place, a picture. You understand that you are there being lied to, that everything what's happening is aimed at some kind of aggressive this is an imposed reality. Yes, it is you who perceive this imposed reality. Yes, there precisely exists such a practice, but it's often used by Kanduks and many others. It's not necessarily those who live in the shadows. It's more often used by those who control them. And, and here is what I wanted to ask. That is, for example, when I understand that this is an imposed reality in a dream, meaning I understand it, there is such a thing that is lotus, it seems to act like a bomb, I don't know. That is, there is some kind of internal explosion and immediately there is a moment of waking up instantly. And if consciousness plunges into this reality again, then the same thing happens. What is this? This is a defense reaction, like Constantine made the sign of the cross. The same is your attempt to get rid of this. You try to immerse yourself in that very lotus. But in this case, it works like a flash, just erasing the shadows. This is normal. Good girl, keep it up. But what should I do to prevent this from happening, because… Develop further, sunshine. It's necessary to become a sun. Once you become a sun, then there will be no shadows. But while you're going along the path, sorry, on the way you're hurting your feet, and you get scratched against branches, we're walking across the thicket. I mean here, you know, such a thicket, a sort of dense forest, with many thorns, this is normal. Don't pay attention and pity yourself less, and everything will be fine. You see the goal, you don't notice obstacles, and everything will be fine. The last question about these states. Can anything external occurring in life influence our inner state in a dream or in anything else? It can, if we are in such an uncertain situation that depends on matter, on consciousness. But if a person, let's say, has developed enough spiritually, nothing external can influence. This is unrealistic. While everything was valuable to us here, everything that is important here for us, in fact, well, it's just temporary, and temporary cannot affect what is infinite and eternal. Thank you. May I ask another question regarding practice? 
exactly the pyramid. I recently had such an experience when in the pyramid while descending from the top into the lotus, it was just like a turbine pulling me there, into the lotus, and then 40 minutes later I was just like if returned. And 40 minutes passed like one minute, but it's precisely the feeling of pulling in, I can't even say that it's a vacuum cleaner, it's more powerful. Just an instant and I was there. This is normal. Again, this is what I've answered. There are such work stages for people, when they simply disappear, and consciousness doesn't understand where they've gone, but they feel as if they were pulled in, right? I mean power. Again, you put the power of your attention where? In the lotus. You were striving for this unity. Well, you got it. But it's natural that the information didn't reach consciousness. And since consciousness is active, the Personality is not yet strong enough to stay in freedom and independence permanently. Well, it turns out that you, as if disappeared and reappeared, is like falling out of time, right? It's normal, it's natural, you just need to develop, to continue working, and that's all. Thank you. May I? A question about the Inner God. Or at a time when the immersion is deeper than usual, the body shudders, something growls inside like a beast that's been caught, and it's not ready for those states at all. And when I get close, I don't understand, is it rejection, or do I hold myself from going into this? Not yourself. Consciousness holds you on a short leash, Meaning, the system holds you, so as not to let you go. But tell me, what kind of dummy would raise a lamp and then just let it go into the forest? Well, it's somehow funny and stupid, right? Well, that's your answer. So don't be a lamp, break the bones and go ahead, and everything will be fine. On the path of spiritual development, the body doesn't always cope, as a rule. This manifests itself in the form of diseases. And we initially said that it could be an influence of some otherworldly beings. But there was such experience too, although there is a suspicion that it is more a work of consciousness. Can consciousness… Hide behind a disease? It can. Consciousness doesn't care which tools to use. But here again, most often, is psychosomatic pathologies. You see? Well, something serious, some organic disorders or something else, viral or some other things. Well, as a rule, consciousness won't form this. That is, it forms a contrived disease. Simply put, these types of tricks it can apply, but something serious is not an enemy to itself. There often happens, of course, well, in overlapping, a person began to engage in the spiritual, while having a number of some pathologies and the like, but the spiritual, in fact, the spiritual path doesn't lead to recovery of one's body. This is an imposed directive from consciousness, a healthy spirit is in a healthy body. If a person is holy, he must be absolutely healthy. Then I have a question, why do they canonize those who are disabled, sick, mad, and the like? They are elevated to the rank of saints, you see? But somehow it contradicts itself. Put simply, Material is for matter, spiritual is for spiritual. On the one hand, our body is, let's say, our prison. Moreover, it's a prison with a bad friend, meaning our consciousness is a bad friend, who will do everything to benefit from us. But such is our troublesome partner, and you can't get away from it for as long as you're here. Therefore, there can be all kinds of manifestations, can it? In other words, put such obstacles in the form of diseases, create those as problems, of course it can. But the point is that if we react to them, this will continue. But if we don't react to them, but respond with love, respond with even greater spiritual fervor, then naturally it understands that the more it presses, the more it loses its power and it stops this practice. And it begins to approach you already with a carrot, but not with a stick. Well, this is also hard. It starts forming self-conceit, or vice versa, as Volodya has told, right? Telling you that you're weak, 
you can't do anything and you'll get nothing. And at the same time, it pushes you. Well, keep doing it, come on, sit in meditation, now we will do it with you. Come on, turn on the lotus, where is it there? What is the lotus? And then it starts. Yet what lotus will you turn on? Wait, where are we going tomorrow? Hell with going tomorrow, what did you eat yesterday? You see, these are the spiritual practices which are being done to say in a bit exaggerated way. I simply can't manage to keep up with the speed and express what it twists in one's head simultaneously from ten sides. Well, this is true. There are still moments when it doesn't take over. That's really when the physical state is bad. But it's not an argument for the personality. It's supposed to be that way. But sometimes it misses such micro-impulses. Let's say a situation is dangerous for the body, for life in general, and it lets in a picture that supposedly should lead to the fact that the personality won't have time to react. Although there are moments there, well, it seems to be urging. Clarify, please. Consciousness urges not to be vigilant. That's bad. I don't know how to… That is, consciousness tries to set you up, makes you rely on personality, as on some tool for physical salvation or health improvement, right? A substitution? Well, okay, I'll take a practical example. When, let's assume, while driving, there is a situation when I understand that it's practically a fraction of second, and I make a decision in this specific driving situation. But at the same time, I clearly understand, clearly heard at that moment that there was as if a command to me, don't do it. So consciousness is ready? It's ready for an injury, of course. And you are not the only one who experienced this while driving. When consciousness starts forcing a person to perform spiritual practice, while you are driving, everything's okay. Let's do the lotus practice. Well, just relax, it's good after all. It's the dictation of consciousness, it's contrary to all, let's say, written canons, the instincts of self-preservation and the like. And it often happens that it even leads to accident, injuries and so on. And then, pulling this string, it uses it as a tool, as a whip, saying, well, you've made yourself sick with your meditations. You see? It told you what to do, and then it's the one that strikes you. One should have a reasonable approach to all things. There is a time for spiritual practices. Spiritual practice is spiritual practice. Time should be devoted to this. For example, you don't train your dog all day long, do you? You have to live, do something, right? It's unrealistic to drive your car and train your dog to jump over a fence at the same time. And why does this become realistic? This is precisely the red line which consciousness mustn't cross. It must fulfill its function. The one it must, and the car, must be driven by consciousness. Personality isn't in the driver's seat. Don't get me wrong. And if an accident has happened, it can't be the fault of personality, it's the fault of consciousness, because it can cover itself. It has deceived the personality. Of course. And later on it will torture you throughout life with this very tool. It's more advantageous for it that the body becomes disabled, immobilized. Well, there's no difference whether the body walks or doesn't walk. The main thing is that it generates emotions, you see? Well, even better if it's also able to generate something else, not just emotions, but also greater powers, to dream about something, to feed, and that's it. And it doesn't care, it's consciousness. This world is actually very cruel. Well, how can it not be cruel, where they eat each other? This is normal, one should just be vigilant. More questions, guys? May I? Yes. I find such a manifestation in myself. It is similar like a memory of the previous life, so to say. I mean, of the previous personality. That is, and the further it goes, the more imposed it becomes. I mean, that state, maybe, yes, this fatality. Are these manifestations of the system? It often happens so, that a person, let's say a personality, that has subpersonalities, meaning having an experience of their lives, those subpersonalities, at certain moments can manifest, indeed manifest, their own, let's say, independence, right? Meaning they can show or bring their own experience to consciousness and the like. And it happens that sometimes they even seize power in people. And this also happens. And we know the experience of some people where dozens of these subpersonalities from time to time commanded them. Well, it does happen. It happens that they show the experience of previous lives in detail, even in the smallest details. But this is the life 
of that personality, which missed its chance. Sometimes even emotions of hopelessness are palmed off. People do have an experience of dying, these fears, all that, of course. If there is a subpersonality, this can be, this can happen, but only if the subpersonality is active. What does active mean? It has additional power. Meaning, I'll give an example. For many, it might be a shock. We have habits, let's say traditions and all that. It's built just to support the system, but not for the spiritual development of a human being. Say, some dear and close person has died. Well, and we recall him every time. We miss him, we experience emotions for him. And people ask, how to help? There were also questions. A person passed away, a relative, for instance, how to help him so that he would be fine there? You better focus on yourself so that it would be fine for you here. The person has already deserved what he deserved, what he received. If a person is spiritually developed and he has spiritually liberated himself, then excuse me, how can you, mortal, help the immortal? And if vice versa, how can you pull him out if he has already got what he deserved, right? It's not a prison to be released from. Or let's say, I don't know, where you can pass a parcel or something delicious, well, here is a point, it turns out that a parcel can be delivered, as well as every memory caused by an emotion. That's why people say, about the deceased, be good or nothing, but better nothing at all. Well, that happened, yes, we remember, yes, but we shouldn't grieve, worry, shed tears or bother them every time. Why? Every memory, since subpersonality exists, it is in this world, and when we recall someone, especially with emotion, we inevitably contact in the invisible world. After all, distance, time, these are all relative terms, and they get broken already at the quantum limit, while beyond the quantum limit there is no such notion at all, you see? Therefore, naturally, if we often and intensely recall a subpersonality which we had a chance to coexist with, let's say, then naturally it can possess a certain power, and it can produce, let's say, such kind of manifestations, yes. Or it can lay claims, especially if the personality is weak, to even seize power in this body and power over consciousness. No matter how paradoxical or fantastical it sounds, but it's true, it's reality, it's already proven. And let's say it has been verified many times, and you cannot get away from it, it's a fact. It's when subpersonalities that lived at different times reveal such subtlest details that cannot be made up. It also happens when, for instance, a person was very keen on magic, accumulated powers, used real practices, and having become a subpersonality after death, he can also influence personality. Or a person tried to grow spiritually, tried, I emphasize, didn't develop spiritually, only tried, but at the same time he's unstable. What does it mean to be unstable? Neither there nor here. That is, he used practices, some power aspects, accumulation. Then naturally, having become a subpersonality, he has a great potential and can exert some influence, because he has an aspiration for life, a desire to make at least one breath of fresh air, let's say, while being in the body, to return to such a state here, like we have now. Yes, that's our consciousness. There's personality, something else. Meaning, of course, there's an enormous desire to return to this life again. So it's normal, it's natural. This can happen. But here's a simple advice. Don't be keen on the dead. You must strive for the alive. Don't let them manifest themselves because their works and other pattern impose on your personality. A lot is being told about past lives. A person perceives reincarnation as his own life. No, it's not your life. Your life is now. Personality has one life. While the fact that there can be a million of subpersonalities, well, those are their problems, right? They burn their lives. Now, you shouldn't give them an opportunity to burn yours as well. But as soon as you start thinking about this and invest your attention there, say skyfish are subtle beings. When our friend invests attention while watching them, they're posing for him. You've seen those posers, haven't you? Why? Because he puts attention into that point just for them. So they come like birds on feet. The same thing here, by investing attention in the past, by activating subpersonality, it can show you and tell you things, but at that time it lives, it feels relieved, it's like a cold breeze or a sip of cool water. In the heat, of course, the subpersonality feels better, but it will do everything possible to involve you more and more into these games. But by that it becomes stronger and stronger. With every portion of your attention, 
By every game with the other world, you strengthen it. Eventually, you can lose yourself. You'll make it a company, you'll play cards together, just kidding, of course. If it were so, it would be wonderful, but they are still alone there. Although they feel and understand that there's someone else nearby. More questions, guys. About the moment here and now. I was standing, washing a pen, and realized that I was extremely happy. And consciousness says right away that I cannot be extremely happy just because I'm standing and washing my pen. Some happiness is waiting for me ahead. And kind of having traced this moment, I realized that many times in my life there were situations when I just felt happy because for no reason at all. But consciousness immediately started telling me that I should either recall something that was in the past. A reason is needed. That is, yes, a reason is needed. And this point… But when you outline a reason, happiness goes away. Right. Absolutely right. This moment of here and now is precisely what personality experiences in contact with the spiritual world. It's the first thing. Well, it's indescribable happiness. It's hard to put it into words. It is that boundless love, well, is indeed happiness. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, washing the toilet, washing the dishes, what's the difference? After all, it has nothing to do with the personality, the spiritual, the real you. Well, the body must function and work, but consciousness mustn't interfere with its comments. Consciousness is always set up for happiness. What is happiness for our consciousness? It's a material aspect. But has anyone experienced happiness? Happiness cannot be like, now it is here and tomorrow it is not. For personality, happiness is eternal. We lose it only when we lose ourselves as personality. That's the point. And what is happiness for consciousness? It means to achieve something, to get something. Well, many of us used to set material goals or something else. Well, someone thinks, I will achieve something, get a better job, earn more money, acquire something, and I will be happy. He's earned, acquired, got it, and happiness is gone. Isn't it so? That's the point. For matter, for consciousness, happiness is illusory, while for personality it's real. It cannot end, and neither can life. Life, in fact, if it begins, it cannot end, otherwise, what kind of life is it? It's like a jump. I won't continue to quote Ranevskaya. That is, in fact, here and now means residing in the present. It is incessant feeling, yes? Correct? Naturally, of course. Consciousness won't understand this. For consciousness, it's an abnormal state. It's even worse than schizophrenia. It's not a normal emotion in psychiatry. Well, it's not an emotion. There are no emotions here, in fact. And that's the paradox. It is qualified as an abnormal emotion. This can be an emotion. This is the inner feeling that generates no emotion at all. There's no release of endorphins. There's nothing. There is no excitation of the structure. Meaning, from the outside, a person looks calm, he is simply joyful, just joyful, and that's it. Why? Because he's overfilled, and consciousness agrees with him. Because consciousness is accustomed and is trained to receive its candy for not making a sad face. And that's it, you see? That's the point. Meaning, it gets its portion of alat for not preventing the personality from being happy and living. Well, such a symbiosis is formed from coexistence. Consciousness doesn't cross the red line, but it still tries to attack a meanie. After all, it's consciousness. Bears also do everything for sugar, but if they see a sack of it, they try to take it away. More questions, guys. Go ahead. Humor is a weapon of this system. Could you please tell, what is the nature of its origin and how to use it correctly? It's desirable to use it so as not to offend anyone, because it's a weapon of the system. That's it, guys. On this merry note, I suggest that we end our meeting today. I'm sorry if anything is wrong. If I've said something beyond the limit, don't be offended. It's consciousness, you know. And what's the point to take offense at it? That's all, thank you.